Hello everyone, and welcome to the full story video for What If Deku Was an Evo, aka What If Deku Had the Powers of Generator Rex. But just two small things before we begin. Number one, I'd like you to take a look at this statistic on screen as it shows my current amounts of views from subscribers and not subscribers. If you're within that 74.3% of viewers who are currently unsubscribed, please consider subscribing, as it's one of the best ways to support the channel for free and to keep yourself up to date with my content. As for those already subscribed, as always, thank you very much, and or just make sure that you're still there, as sometimes YouTube will do a little, you know, tricky stuff and just kind of unsubscribe you on purpose. And number two, and this does tie back into subscribing. I know this series abrupt end wasn't what his fans were hoping for, but I do still believe it was the best thing for us to do, as it now opens it up to one day return to the better concept of what if the events of Generator Rex, or what if Generator Rex himself was in My Hero Academia. So for now, we'll give this series this one last hurrah with this full story compilation, as well as put any proceeds it makes towards that eventual project. So without any more preamble, enjoy the show. Now sadly, Generator Rex was a pretty underrated series on Cartoon Network, so I want to give a quick synopsis of it before we jump into the actual what if. After an experiment goes horribly wrong, microscopic robots called nanites are spread throughout the world, infecting every living creature on Earth. Now this isn't so bad, as nanites can be harmless most of the time. They were originally created to solve issues like world hunger or illness, but sometimes they can activate too far and turn things into exponentially variegated organisms, or EVOs for short. But there is one person in the world who has full control over his nanites and even has the ability to cure others when their nanites go out of control. Rex Salazar, Agent of Providence. Rex's full power set is quite extensive. He can create powerful machines out of his body parts, control the nanites of other evos, and even has technopathic abilities as well as increased durability and regeneration. And using these powers, he works alongside Providence to protect the world from dangerous evos. With that out of the way, let's jump into the story and explore a timeline where our favorite up and coming hero is blessed with the abilities of Generator Rex. Now this timeline, up until Deku's last year in middle school, remains extremely similar to the main story timeline. The one major change is that Deku is not deemed quirkless. In fact, his pinky toe has indeed taken on the more streamlined design of the human body that other quirk holders have. The only problem is his quirk is deemed completely worthless for hero work. Deku's quirk is called nanites, and when running a blood test, the doctor is able to see that Deku has teeny tiny robots throughout his body. Further tests reveal that because of this, Deku has a very small healing factor. Let's say to the level that if he were to break his arm, it would take him a week or two to heal it completely, whereas others would need two or more months to do so. Deku is also a small bit more durable than the average human being. So Deku isn't quirkless in this timeline, he just doesn't have a quirk flashy enough to be a great hero. He desperately wants to be one, but everyone tells him he'd be better off as a cop. As for his relationship with other people around him, his mother doesn't carry around much guilt. She supports her son's dreams in a superficial way, the same way someone would support their child's dream to be a pro athlete or a celebrity. She supports him by encouraging him to give it his all and to apply himself, but by no means is she betting on him becoming a hero, any more than she's betting on herself becoming one. As for Kachan and his gang, well Deku does have a quirk in this timeline. So he has a bit more confidence than in canon because it can't be looked down on as quirkless. So they lay off him about as much as they do the other students they go to school with that have lame quirks. So Deku could not even end up with the spiteful nickname of Deku, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll still refer to him as such. Now the day that the series picks up, Deku actually raises his hand a bit nervously instead of being called on by the teacher when he asks who all wants to go to UA. And because of this, Bakugo doesn't get outright mad, at least not to the same extent that he does in canon. But after class, he does pull Deku aside, and in an uncharacteristically kind moment, at least for Bakugo, expresses his doubts in Deku's ability to make it into UA. This is only significant because Bakugo is genuinely expressing concern for Deku's well-being, just in a very mean way. He explains that heroes like All Might were cool and all, but cops did the majority of the work on this hero society. He might as well jump off the roof of the school before becoming a hero, because either way, he'd be throwing his life away. With that said, the blonde gives his classmate back his notebook and leaves. Afterward, Deku goes the exact same way home than he did in canon, but he's still feeling pretty dejected after that conversation, but much less so than in canon, and he's still attacked by the sludge villain, as nothing that happened with the sludge villain at All Might has changed in this timeline. The sludge villain still attempts to steal Deku's body, but here we get a slightly different process than what we did in canon. Now from what we know, Deku has never been in a life-threatening situation before this instance, and because of this, Deku's nanites are now activating and fighting back against the villain as he attacks. 
though this is only happening on a super small scale, so it's not really visible outside of that. So only the sludge villain and Deku to a small amount are able to notice the amount of resistance and change in Deku. But before anyone can question what's happening, All Might, using the wind from a smash, is able to knock the sludge villain away and capture him, though Midoriya still passes out afterwards. When waking up, the situation is the exact same, and Deku still decides to hitch a ride with All Might against his will. Later on a rooftop, he tells All Might that he does have a quirk, but it's just so mundane that he and most people doubt he could fight crime with it. Mild healing and increased durability were not going to carry Deku as a hero. But in the middle of their talk, All Might still runs out of time and has to revert to his true form, where he reveals his secret to Deku, and, like in canon, advises Deku that being a hero is a dangerous job, where his life will be on the line constantly. But instead of saying he doesn't think he can be a hero, he strongly advises him to seek out a life in law enforcement. He consists of the heroic heart of this kid and sees no reason for that to go a waste, but something safer would be much better for him. And with that said, Deku is still pretty heartbroken. His idol just crushed his dream, gently yet still crushed them. In spite of this, Deku still thanks All Might for his time, and the two decide to part ways, with Deku going the same way home that he did in canon but neither were aware that All Might had dropped the sludge villain until too late. Because of this, the next event is similar to canon, with Izuku, All Might, and the other pro heroes frozen in fear and apprehension to save Bakugo as he is attacked by the sludge villain. But finally, in defiance of all he had been told today and his entire life, Deku acts without thinking and rushes in to save his former friend. He employs his plan to blind his enemy as he did in canon and begins to try and tear the sludge away from Bakugo to free him, while everyone's words run through his mind. But so does one other thought, I have to be stronger to save him. And in an instant, the nanites in his body form massive gauntlets that allow him to pull Bakugo completely away from the sludge villain and miraculously do not injure him more than a bruise or so. Denied again and by the same boy, the sludge villain rushes at Deku angrily, scaring him. Though as he tried to cover himself with his now massive mechanical hands, he remembers that he has them. He also remembers how All Might had blown the Sludge Villain away, and claps both his hands together right before the villain had mauled him, blowing the Sludge Villain away and breaking his first ever build in the process. Being the first to shake off their surprise, the police and heroes begin to detain the villain, while civilians begin to cheer Deku, praising him for his amazing quirk and his bravery. That is, until Deku began to scream out in pain. You see, in the canon of Generator Rex, Rex has a full Evo form that came out when he first got his nanites. This is because at this point, Rex did not have full control over his nanites, and I'm going to say that at the moment, Deku has lost control of his as well. As a result, he is unable to keep control of himself or his nanites, and they begin to build machines against his will. It's almost like something out of Akira, until finally, he creates a giant mechanical form around the size of Mount Lady that begins to rampage through the city. Everyone seeing this began to panic, but finally, the symbol of peace and number one hero gets over his fear and hesitation, which turned into shock and a small amount of guilt for what he had said to Deku earlier, and then back into shock when he transformed into the iron freaking giant. He returns to his hero form and rockets at Deku, hitting his mechanical chest and forcing the giant mech to stagger back as he jumps up to Deku's mechanical face and tries to calm him down by reasoning with him. He expresses his sorrow for his earlier words and gratitude for Deku's bravery, but if he wasn't able to bring this awesome power under control, then Deku truly couldn't be a hero. Unfortunately, Deku seemed too out of it to hear anything that All Might just said, so All Might just resorts to plan B, brute force. He rears back and releases a huge smash that destroys the mech's head and begins to wreck his way inside, already deducing that this wouldn't actually hurt Deku. Not long after, a triumphant cry from the number one hero is heard and he burst from the large machine carrying an unconscious Deku. Luckily, the rampage didn't do a huge amount of damage, and the massive machine seemed to disassemble itself without Deku still inside it. A while later, Deku wakes up being tended to by paramedics, but they deem him to be perfectly fine. He's released from their care. He notices that his mother had apparently been called to the scene, since in this timeline, him being unconscious would cause his emergency contacts to be informed, with her where a relieved Mitsuki Bakugo and her angry son accompanying her. After Inko was done fretting over Izuku, Bakugo's mother smacked him in the back of his head and the blonde growled out his thanks before walking off in a tantrum. Inko Midoriya, happy her son was okay and that he apparently had been able to stop a crisis before inadvertently creating another one, directs her son to follow her so that they can leave and go home. Before they can though, All Might approaches them with words of encouragement for Deku. 
He tells him that all great heroes have one commonality in their origin stories, acting first and thinking later. He apologizes for what he said earlier and is genuinely surprised when Deku swears to him that he wouldn't reveal his secret. He had completely forgotten about him finding out about that. The kid just seemed so trustworthy and genuine it wasn't a concern. He leans down to Deku's level and looks him in the eyes before telling him that he can definitely be a hero. He could have even without an awesome quirk like this. And now all he had to do was work hard and gain control of this power and with that he could definitely be the number one hero. Deku spent the rest of the day crying tears of joy at being told this. Even his All Might sent him a business card that had his personal phone number on it. He mentioned that he wanted to keep an eye on bright new heroes and to call him if he ever needed them. A few days later, around 6 in the morning, Deku is awoken by rough knocking on his front door. He walks downstairs tirely and opens the door to see Bakugo and Workout Clouds holding a scowl on his face. Bakugo growls at Deku that he better get his nerdy ass in gear. Deku is confused by this and Bakugo announces that for the next 10 months he'd be training Deku to control that crazy quirk of his and get him into UA. With that said, he lights his hand up in small explosions and tells Deku to get dressed for their training or die and the green haired kid ran off to do just that. During a brutal morning run while Deku was nearly passing out, he tries to ask Bakugo why he helped him, but Bakugo for one corrects helping to train him. He was only making sure that Deku didn't lose control of himself again. As the future number one hero, it'd be a blemish on his rep if you had to kill him. And for another thing, he did owe him one for saving him. In canon, he was able to in a way save himself. Deku was more of a catalyst for that, but here, he was the direct reason for his current safety. Besides, beating on him for almost a year could do some decent training for him, and at least it might help Deku too. And that is how the two become training partners. Mornings would start with brutally long runs that only ended when someone threw up followed by calisthenic exercises until neither could feel their body parts any longer. After that, they go to school on the weekdays, while evenings would be times for their sparring. I could even see the two start to study together when the situation actually calls for it. As for quirk training, Deku is still very hesitant to use his quirk again, so about a month later, Bakugo calls an end to their training for good. He was fed up with Deku being too scared to use his quirk. If he wasn't going to learn how to use it, then he was just wasting his time. Afterwards, Deku returns home, disheartened and confused. He was just scared of losing control again. If he did, All Might could be the only person that could stop him. Wait, All Might, maybe he could give Deku some advice. He tries All Might's personal phone number and is blown away when the hero indeed picks up. After getting the fanboy to calm down, All Might has him explain why he called. And after hearing the problem, he can actually really understand the dilemma here and tells Deku to meet him at Dagobah Beach tomorrow. Arriving at the beach at the instructed time, all Might greets Deku and explains his thinking about the beach. After that, he explains that he thinks this would be a good testing ground for Deku's quirk. He is still hesitant and All Might tries to think of a mental image for him to focus on and finally gets an idea. He tells Deku to envision using a tool to complete a task. You can't be too rough with the tool or you might break something, but you can't be too gentle or you accomplish nothing. And with this new direction to take using his powers, All Might gives Deku the challenge of cleaning the beach. He focuses and creates his first purposeful build, the now dubbed Smash Hands, and begins to scoop up and crush the trash, compacting it and sorting it away neatly. Over the rest of the week, All Might would come back to check on his progress and ends up very impressed with how well he'd done and the amount of control that Deku had gained over his quirk. With his confidence in his quirk now firmly installed, he returns to the usual training spot that he and Bakugo had frequented and finds LeBlanc there. Deku wastes no time and shows how much control he'd gained by creating the smash hands and instantly the two begin to spar. Now from here we're going to do a basic time skip past the last 8 months and 3 weeks of training, but I'll be leaving the story here to explain what Deku and Bakugo were able to achieve and ask you guys a few questions. Bakugo probably wouldn't achieve a huge amount from their training. Like All Might said, it's hard to level up when you start from a high level than it is when you start from a low one, but he did have a partner slash rival so you can see growth through competition. You can expect small increases in physical attributes like strength and stamina, and maybe a small boost to his cooperation stat. As for Deku, through training, he is able to build some physical strength and condition his body to a more athletic state. Not exactly as much as in canon, but further training would get him to that level at some point. Aside from this, Deku soon discovers that he can do more with his builds than just the smack hands. Thinking of blueprints for what is known in the canon of Generator Rex as the Punk Busters, these come about when Deku tries to jump away from one of Bakugo's big attacks one day. Now Bakugo and Midori had finished their 10 months of training. 
and Deku only has two builds, the Smash Hands and what Bakugo had dubbed as the Skull Stompers. Deku isn't too fond of this name, but Bakugo makes it stick nonetheless. The boys part ways on their last day of training, eager to get a good night's rest and go to the UA entrance exams. A lot of the build up to the test will remain pretty much the same, since it isn't like Deku used one for all at any moment during the test instructions. Though the two had trained together, Bakugo and Midori are pretty happy to be put in separate testing groups, the former more than the latter. But the test is set, and the only real difference between this timeline and canon is that Deku has no real reservations on using his power, since nanites won't destroy his body parts. That said, if Deku creates either of his builds, he needs a bit of cooldown time before he can make another one, just as strong as the last. And he won't be as nervous as canon either. This means that Deku, like most of the other students, is in fact able to attain villain points. This is the trend that the test follows, with Deku using his massive mechanical monos to earn some points. That is until the gigantic zero point robot is unleashed. Seeing it like the other students, his first instinct is to run, but when realizing a girl was trapped and in danger, his body once again acted on instinct, running over to save her. Now Deku isn't stupid, so at first he simply uses the smash hands to lift rubble and debris off of the girl, but with her leg being hurt and him being scared to carry her with his build on, he was left with two options stay and fight the robot to try and buy time until the test ended, or release his current build and carry her that way to flee. He decided on doing the smart thing and running, but it wasn't like he could run extremely fast and he was weighed down with the person he was saving. Waiting for his nanites to build back up was going to take way too long and the huge machine was covering way more ground than he was just by running. He didn't know why, but Deku did the only thing he could think of and threw the girl to the side so she'd be out of the way of danger. He knew the machine would be on top of him in any moment and so he turned around, refusing to go down without a struggle. He was able to produce a single smash hand that was smaller than they normally were and reared it back before punching the tread of the robot with it to try and stop it just a little bit and he did receive some success. The timer had to be close to going off, right? He was soon beginning to get pushed back and he could see cracks beginning to form in the smash hand. It finally broke and he was left trying to push back with his own flesh and blood. He just wanted the machine to stop. Then something strange happened. Blue wire-like patterns began to form on his hand as his nanites interfaced with the machine. Soon, its right tread stopped, causing Deku to cheer as he did it. He made it stop. Or so it seemed. His clumsy use of this new ability caused only one of the treads of the robot to stop, meaning it was basically tripping over itself and it began to fall. Panicking, he had no idea what to do and simply tried to cover the person he was trying to save with his own body. But then, the voice of his hero rung out around the city. Good show, young man! But you and I have got to stop meeting like this. Detroit Smash! The number one hero then hit the robot straight on in the face, hard enough for it to fly back and explode epically. As he looked down and saw Izuku Midori fanboying out at what he just saw, he thought to himself, Kids got even more promise than I thought. Maybe. Finally, the timer does go off. It was almost like some unseen force had extended a few seconds out into a much longer span of time to make something cool happen, but I digress. Thanks to the heroics of Deku and the last minute interference of All Might, no one is hurt more than a few scrapes and scratches. And because of a good mix of villain points and rescue points, Deku is ranked higher in the test than in canon. The green head would still have to wait a few weeks to see if he got into UA or not, but I think that he won't be as mopey since he'll still be in contact with Bakugo and his mom is there to cheer him up like in canon. Finally, he receives a letter welcoming him to the Hero Academia of UA High School. But we'll skip ahead to Class 1A's first day, and of course, Eraserhead gives his quirk assessment test. But Deku actually would do very well at these. At the moment, his builds are perfectly suited for all the tests. Standing long jump with the Skull Stompers will likely be one of the highest in the class. Same with the 50 meter dash, endurance running, and side to side stepping. While tests like grip strength and upper body training are dominated by the Smash Hands. The only problem is the wait time between builds. If he needed the Skull Stomper to smash hands back to back, he'd get lucky. But if he had to switch between the two, it would cause him to go through that wait time and he had to try it with his own body parts. We finally reached the softball throwing portion of the test. After watching Bakugo and the others make their individual throws, Midoriya gets an idea. See, up to this point, he hasn't consciously created his own builds. The smash hands came when he tried to save Bakugo from the sludge villain, and the Skull Stompers were a defensive build to keep Bakugo from roasting him during the training. Huh. A lot of his builds seem to be based around Bakugo. Weird. But this was the first time he actively thought of a new build. Then Aizawa Sensei finally declares that he is next and Deku asks for just a few more minutes as he worked this out. He was muttering and drawing in the dirt, trying to form some blueprints of some kind. 
Eraserhead orders him to hurry up or fail immediately and be sent home, and Deku startles but walks over to make his own throw. He holds out his hand, but instead of a smash hand being formed, a massive cannon is created that he braces on his shoulder like a bazooka. This was a snipe cannon. He sets the ball on the ground behind him and angles the weapon just right. Then the back of the cannon shoots into the ground, biting it up into a ball and grinding it into a projectile. Deku then fires off with his cannon and his ball goes a little over 1100 feet. He sweat drops and explains to his teacher that if he let him figure out the inner workings of this build a little more, he would have been able to shoot even further. And this intrigues Aizawa. Because of how well Deku's builds are suited for these tests, he actually ends up as either like third or fourth place in the class ranking, which will piss Bakugo off a tiny bit. Seems like he trained a little too well. But with Deku not being in the last place, Mineta is kicked out of UA. Now, here's something that has always been a bit strange to me about the story. Why is it okay for one student to be dropped? I would imagine that classes are supposed to be made even for things such as combat exercises that All Might gives or the versus battle with teachers. You couldn't really do these in a simple and effective way without an even number of participants because you meant to have certain students or teachers compete twice to something which might kind of mess the results up. So what I want to do is ask you guys a question in a poll. Would you like the number one of class 1B to move up into class 1A to fill Mineta's empty seat and keep the class even, while who didn't score enough to make it into class 1B could be moved up there as well, and we continue that trend until everything evens out in UA, or just have an uneven class 1A, and the future of how this will move out can just be figured out from there. The first day of class finishes off as it did in canon, though something interesting to happen here would be Deku's budding friendship with Tenya Ida and Ochaka Uraraka coming into play with his whatever it is with Bakugo. In this scenario, I could definitely see Deku approaching Bakugo after school to ask him what he thought of their first day, and that would bring his two new friends into close contact with his one older one. Ochako probably still views Bakugo as mean and scary, with Ida still thinking he's a bit too gruff and kind of a punk for his taste, but if Deku gets along with him, he can't be all bad in their minds. So what would be a trio in the original timeline kind of becomes a trio that forces a fourth person to hang out and spend time with them even though he openly dislikes them and doesn't want to be around them. Before he can leave the school, Aizawa actually approaches Deku. He doesn't express it, but his on-the-spot creation of his new build, the Snipe Cannon, showed a lot of promise and potential. Eraserhead would probably feel very irrational about not building upon that potential, pun intended. The problem with that is that none of the teachers in Midoriya's current hero courses would be able to truly focus on the versatility his quirk actually has. Yagi Rose has a very similar situation, but under a different circumstance where he didn't have two students with a similar versatility and their abilities, he likely wouldn't act on something like this and inconvenience one of his peers. For now, he'd like to at least introduce Midoriya to Power Loader and see if the support course teacher had any tips for his student. The two arrive to the support class workshop and the room pretty much explodes as soon as they arrive there. We then get the introduction of Power Loader as he scolds his own student whose latest invention had been the cause of said explosion. The pro apologizes to Eraserhead and introduces his student, Mei Hatsume. In turn, as irrational as it is, Eraser lets it slide and introduces the nervous and shocked Midoriya for explaining why he wants the two to meet and directing Midoriya to give a more in-depth explanation of his quirk and how he uses it. Still a little bit nervous and put off by this situation, Izuku explains how his quirk Nanites works and demonstrates it by creating a very small single smash hand. This impresses and intrigues Power Loader and it makes Mei so excited and surprised that she begins asking Deku questions at a few trillion miles a minute and studying the smash hand created by getting a little too close for Deku's comfort. Power Loader calms her down and examines Deku's quirk and explains that he is very busy, but if Midoriya wants, he can definitely come and see Power Loader when he didn't have class to receive advice when he wants to or when he has free time. And Hatsume is very excited to work with him and see how he can help her improve her own babies. Mulling it over for only a little bit, Midori is happy to accept this offer as it'll help him grow more knowledgeable about engineering and it'll make him stronger overall. Even though Hatsume seems a bit too forward for his taste, remember he's maintained a friendship with Bakugo before even arriving to UA, so he's somewhat used to eccentric and passionate people. For now, he and Eraserhead conclude their visit and Deku leaves for the day to go home. That said, Eraserhead does warn Deku not to overwhelm Power Loader by always coming to him when he had a problem. Learn from him and suck up the knowledge he was willing to give, but also be willing to be your own hero and come up with your own ideas because your teachers won't always be there when you're an actual pro hero. 
With that, Midori is sent home, and Aizawa decides that he will indeed introduce Momo Yayorozu to Power Loader. The very next day, as in canon, the students have normal everyday high school classes in the morning and eat their lunch later in the day. That morning though, Isuka Kendo is introduced to her new class, and Eraserhead explains that with Minata gone to fill out the class, they have brought in Isuka from class 1B, and a student from another class had taken her place in 1B. Later in the day, afternoon classes kick off, and All Might arrives, still wanting to do some battle training. The students are told to suit up by All Might, and now we have the issue of Deku's costume in this timeline. Now, right off the bat, Deku's costume will look like his canon version for the sake of visuals. This is just for simplicity's sake, even though canonically in this timeline, he has awoken his quirk nearly a year before he joins UA and would have specific kind of specifications for what his quirk and his suit should kind of help him to do. That said, I personally can't think of too many things that this timeline's Deku would really need in his costume. Nanites allows him to build his machines over his clothes like Rex does in his canon series and it's possible to just let him wear something completely normal that just makes him look cool, kind of like how Jiro and Kaminari do. So in that vein, you actually could give him a costume that looks like Generator Rex's costume. For now, I'm not going to do that, though I do have one idea for a costume he could have in this timeline, I'm just not going to introduce it just yet. He might have to get his current costume destroyed before he has this new idea I'm having, so just wait on it. Now, as for Class 1A's indoor anti-personnel battle training, the parameters of the fight are still the same. Nuclear weapon, time limit, capture the villains or secure the weapons for the heroes to win, capture the heroes or wait out the time limit for the villains to win. And that said, teams are still drawn by lots, but since this is canonically a randomized event in a different timeline, it makes sense to have different teams than in canon. For those of you who haven't seen my What If Jiraiya Dr. Naruto series, this will be the first time you'll see me introducing this idea. With multiverse theory, say if you were to flip a coin and got heads, there's technically supposed to be a different universe where you instead got tails. My idea with this is, in a different universe, it should not come up the exact same events, meaning you get different matchups for teams and matchups in fights. So, to determine these randomized teams, since there are 20 students in Class 1A, I simply use a D20 and the Class 1A seating chart, which should be on screen right now. This is how I got teams A through H. And then I used a random matchup generator to decide which of these teams would be going up against each other. And then I flipped a coin to see who would be the heroes and who would be the villains. Heads for heroes, tails for villains. Now, to save time on narration, I'm just going to have these listed on screen for a good while so you guys can get a good look at exactly who is the heroes and who is the villains and who's on what team. Blue letters are heroes and red are villains. Also, quick disclaimer, I'm not sure how some people don't realize this. But when I say I randomize a battle in a what if, I actually do mean it and I'm not lying about it. These actually are the randomized results that I came up with. I simply do the randomized matchups before I actually finish the script. I've gotten a few comments that argue if the fights are randomized, how did I come up with a choreographed and planned fight, and it's crazy I have to actually explain this, but I just write the events of the randomized matchup after I randomize it. Anyway, with match 1, Team B faces off against Team H. There really isn't much to say here. I feel like Aoyama and Sero have such different personalities, it'd be hard for them to plan anything, while Ida and Midoriya would likely be on the same page from the start of this. Basically, they just set up Ida to protect the weapon while Deku patrols the building, kind of like they do in canon. Naval Laser could possibly destroy Deku's builds because it's shown to destroy the robots during the entrance exams, and Sero's tape could be a problem as well, but Deku has studied his classmates' powers through the entrance exams and the assessment tests, so I don't see him getting beaten by those two techniques too easily. Beyond that, Aoyama does have a very small limit right now, and let's say that Sero tries to kind of tape Deku down or maybe use his, you know, smash hands against him and kind of tape him to a surface so they can keep moving by. Deku could probably just rip his smash hand apart from the uh, the ground and just kind of pull the ground up with it. So, Sarah's in a really bad position with Deku. It's just a really poor matchup at this point in their development as heroes. So, I think that Deku picks apart his opponents really, really easily and ends up capturing them. In match 2, Team D takes on Team C and I easily give this one to Team D. Koda is so shy at this point in the timeline that Kaminari's personality will likely be a bit off-putting to him and causing him to be a pretty poor partner to plan with. Not to mention they have to protect the weapon instead of actually going to get it. And Koda probably couldn't be too effective in this scenario because he won't be able to call him birds. He might be able to call him bugs, but that's about it. Kaminari also has a very poor limit to his quirk at this point, meaning he can't fight forever. On the other hand, Kendo is a really dangerous close-range fighter who doesn't have a poor stamina issue. 
And using Shoji's powers, they can probably locate where the other team is really, really easily and find them really, really quickly. So now this puts Kaminari in a position where he can't really use the attacks because if he does, he might hurt Koda or might even set up their weapon. So it's pretty much checkmate at this point. I do, however, acknowledge that Koda is canonically very physically strong. So maybe if he decided to fight, it could help a tiny bit. But even then, you're still up against two very good, strong physical fighters. So it might kind of cancel itself out. I really do give the Team D, but maybe with an asterisk. In match three, Team E goes against Team G. I think Team G easily takes this fight in most scenarios, but Tokuyami is very, very smart, and I can see him knowing Todoroki is the biggest threat here, not just in this test, but pretty much at school right now, and planning around him with Higakure, though I don't see this being easy for them at all. Honestly, Todoroki could end this fight in an instant and be done with it, and I do acknowledge that idea, but I do want to go over the one scenario I came up with where I think that Tokuyami and Higakure can actually pull the win out. Todoroki would start off the fight as he does in canon with trying to freeze the floor, but Dark Shadow is there to help Tokuyami escape. During this attack, he thinks that he might have been able to hit Higakure as well, and Todoroki actually hears her scream out as if her feet have been frozen to the floor, so he basically just focuses on Tokuyami, thinking that Higakure is no longer an issue. With that done, Tokuyami has Dark Shadow rush Ojiro, who jumps out of the way. He's then tackled by something invisible, and it's revealed that Higakure had actually been riding on Dark Shadow. She's then able to capture Ojiro, who is caught off guard and flustered by the fact that he's basically just had a naked girl on top of him. Tokuyami explains that from the beginning, they knew that Todoroki would have some type of right reaching move that would end this extremely fast, or he would not have been admitted to the school on recommendation. This is why he had his idea to have Hagakure ride on Dark Shadow, just though they had an insurance card in case he did have a move like that. That way, she could be present in the room and her voice could be heard to make the illusion of her being on the ground and not riding on Dark Shadow the entire time. It was a really clever decoy. Todoroki realizes the bit of a pickle he's in, but before either of the two can try and get close to him, he forces them back with a wall of ice and tries to freeze the weapon to capture it. This could actually work as there isn't much Team E can do about this, so either All Might use the intercom to say that Team G wins here, he tells Todoroki that that doesn't count as capturing the weapon, in which case I think Team E can have a tough time pulling up the win here, or Tokoyami himself, Hagakure, and Dark Shadow try to overwhelm Todoroki with a 3 man assault, which actually could be pretty effective in this situation. If this were to happen, I think that Team E does pull out the win, but I am 100% aware that Team G deserves it in most situations. So I'm going to give it to Team E because I think they just deserve it, but Team G as well has a really good chance of winning. Remember, my scenarios are not the end-all be-all, and disagreements and individual opinions are fine and are going to pop up no matter what. I'm just saying that for my scenario, Team E pulls out this win. Match 4 kicks off with Team I and Team J clashing. I think all members of these teams can mesh really well together and come up with some really good plans. Kirishima is the most tactical guy, but Asui is a really smart person and could maybe try and think up some good strategies for them. But with Ochako and Rikido on a team together, I think there is a really good plan they could use. Using Sato's strength to bust up rubble from the ground and Uraraka's powers to make it weightless, the two teammates can make a supposed wall or barrier of rubble around the weapon. Then, all they have to do is give it back its weight, so it's a lot harder to get through. And now, they have a second degree of defense. Now that said, for this plan, Sato would have used up a good amount of his stamina for it, and the sounds of kind of busting up the rubble and moving it around would have alerted Kirishima and Suyu to where they are, and the Suyu and Kirishima are already fresh and haven't really used their powers too much. So if Sato conks out in the middle of the fight, he leaves Uraraka alone, and in a two-on-one fight against Kirishima and Suyu, that's a really bad thing. Now, even beyond that, I think that Sue could just speed blitz them while Kirishima handles the fighting. Now, even if he's made weightless, I think that Sue would plan around this and kind of expect this. He could just use Kirishima as a weightless wrecking ball while he's hardened to do a lot of damage to the other team. So, I'm going to give this to Team J pretty easily. Though, again, both teams have a really good matchup and a really good ability to kind of plan around each other and make some really good combo moves up. So, you can really give this either way. The final match has Team F and Team A face off. Like with the first match, I can see this being a pretty open and shut case. Jiro is the only member of Team F with an extremely long range attack, but it could backfire in such a small and enclosed space. Meanwhile, Ashido's moves are a bit too lethal for this type of maneuver. Remember how Bakugo almost got disqualified for using his big gauntlet attack? She could also get disqualified for kind of melting one of her opponents. 
Now that said, I can actually see the two of them coming up with a really good, decent plan, because Jiro is pretty intelligent, and Ashido is really creative, so these two could really come up with something good. Meanwhile, I see Bakugo, like in canon, being a very hard teammate to come up with a plan with. Momo is so logical, yet somewhat soft-spoken, that I could see her shying away from him and just accepting his plan to just rush in and attack by himself. That said, in this timeline, I see two factors coming into play during this situation. Being around Deku may possibly, just maybe, calm Bakugo down a tiny, eeny bitty bit, and that and his being seen with Izuku, Uraka, and Tenya at the last two days of school at lunch may make him seem a bit more approachable. If all else fails, I could maybe see Momo approaching Deku, who is friends with Bakugo in this timeline, so to speak, or maybe Deku approaching her and just getting some advice about how to deal with Bakugo and how to come up with a plan with him. If this were to happen, Izuku could possibly broker some type of plan that both team members agree to by wording it in a way that he knows Bakugo will like. What if they could win without throwing a single attack? Though it's a bit too passive for his taste, Bakugo likes the idea of being so far above his opponents, he never even has to throw a punch. It's like he's only using 1% of his power or something. Seeing that he likes the idea, Deku has Bakugo produce one of his flashbang grenades for Momo to study and learn how to reproduce it. But because he does this, I think Deku would feel a need to go over and give Ashido and Jiro some help with their plan as well, just to be fair without spoiling the other team's plan. What he tells them, I'm not so sure. Their powers aren't great for this situation, and they're still very new to hero training, and they don't really mesh too well. So there's not too many ideas that I can come up with, but Deku is probably a better tactician than me, so I'm sure he could do something in the actual situation. When the match starts, Momo and Katsuki quickly find their opponents and throw out a large amount of the grenades into the room, which they just aren't prepared for. They're stunned by the flashbangs, and Bakugo rushes into the room and captures the weapon. I think this will be the fastest match of the day, in fact. Later, everyone kind of introduces themselves a bit more, and they get to know each other a bit before they all go home. With no one being hurt and the battle training being mostly lighthearted, as well as Deku introducing himself to Ashido earlier, I can maybe see her suggesting the class go out and do something as a group after school. She is one of the most outgoing and friendly people in the class, and with her and Hal having a relationship with Deku in some type of friendship, and Deku already having a pretty good friend group himself, it would make sense for them to kind of be more interactive with each other a lot earlier in the timeline than they are in canon. The more outgoing and friendly people in the class, like Ochako, would definitely go to this, and I introduced this idea now because I just think it is a chance for organic fallout from this situation that results more in development of characters and relationships rather than power growth. A few days later, reporters would still swarm the school since All Might is teaching there, and during this time, Deku may go and seek some more guidance from Power Loader, maybe a way to make his builds non-stick or more reinforced from really high-impact lasers or something. This wouldn't result in too much, just more engineering knowledge for Deku and a deepened relationship with Power Loader and Hatsume. Aizawa still gets everyone some helpful feedback from the battle training, and the class president has to be picked. Here, I can really see a huge change happening. With so many people being influenced by Deku in this first few weeks of class, I can see him getting way more than three votes for this timeline. Momo may also vote for him, as well as Ida, and likely Ochako, and maybe even Ashido. Deku is a bit more confident in this timeline, but not by an extreme amount. At lunch that day, I can see a very similar conversation to what happened in canon taking place, but there's a lot more people there. Bakugo, Ashido, Yairozu, and probably a lot of others tip of the group too. If this were to happen, I could see Deku receiving a lot more encouragement to pursue being the class president, and maybe even one threat not to quit from Bakugo. And this likely will influence him some. The big panic in the halls will still happen, and Ida still calms everyone down. Later on, Deku stands in front of the class and asks Aizawa if it would be possible to have two vice presidents. It is illogical, but I don't see him objecting to this. With that, Deku elects Tenya Ida to be one of his vice presidents along with Momo Yairozu and help Deku to lead the class. Later on a Wednesday, Habit Headgear attacks the city, but in this timeline, he doesn't get too far. Mount Lady is shown to be pretty beat up in this fight in the manga, and I don't think that this happens here. All Might just arrives and Missouri smashes him way faster than he does in canon, since his speed hasn't really dropped at all since he still has one for all this time. That said, I do think he's going to be running a bit late for now. Stopping to deal with headgear is still a delay nonetheless. Meanwhile, Class 1A still travels to the USJ for rescue training, and Deku is able to wear his costume like everyone else since it isn't destroyed. The class would then meet with 13, and he gives his entire explanation of what today's training is supposed to be. Unfortunately, something unexpected happens and interrupts his training. Villains begin flooding into the USJ, and Racerhead orders 13 to evacuate the students out of the facility as he rushes into the fray to take on the small fried villains. 
the entire situation with Kuro Giri would likely still happen as it does in canon, with Deku still being a bit overwhelmed by this whole situation and everything going on with it. Though it's possible to also randomize the individual zones the students are sent to and which students are sent there, I think it would be a bit too hard to do so, and as such, I'll be leaving them the same as canon places and replacing Mineta with Kendo, but I do acknowledge the possibility of this being a randomized event as well. Deku is dropped into the flood zone where Suyu saves him from being chowed on by a villain and gets him and Kendo onto the ship to regroup. This conversation goes a lot like the one in canon, with everyone detailing their quirks and what they'd actually do. Deku racks his brain for a way out of this. He had been working on a new way of using a movement build other than the Skull Stompers, but even if they did jump super far, he's not sure if they'll clear the water, and he's not even sure if the villains will leave them alone if they do get out of the water. No, they have to deal with the villains first and then escape. The boat is then about to sink and Deku gulps and looks to Suyu. He thinks he has one way of taking out the villains in one fell swoop, but he is not 100% sure if it'll work. His classmate tells him she'll cover him if things go south, making Deku a lot more confident. Summoning up a smash hand, he makes it much larger than he usually would, almost twice the normal size and extremely hard to lift. He had been thinking about some of the possible modifications that Power Loader and he had been talking about over the last few days, and some of the nature of water, and with that, he dives in. Heaving the water smash hand first, he cheers as the new modification to his oldest build actually works and the mechanical fist of the smash hand begins to spin at high RPMs, making the water swirl around it. This causes him to drive down to the bottom of the pool very, very quickly and create a whirlpool, sucking the villains into it. The spinning force actually is a bit too much for him to manage and the spinning fist actually drills a large hole in the bottom of the pool, making the water spigot to drain out and pull the villains into it. Deku finally releases the build and allows it to crumble as he tries his hardest for another build so soon after he just released a very large one, though he gets lucky. A tiny, incomplete skull stomper is his only reward, but he uses it to jump through the bottom of the pool and out of the center of the whirlpool, making the water churn and explode as two different very powerful forces push and pull the water with the villain still inside of it. The rough force is actually enough to knock all of them out in one fell swoop, and Deku jumps out of the water. In an instant, Sue catches Deku mid-air, and with him and Kendo, she leaps away from the boat as he tries to regain some stamina. Aside from this, everything happening away from Deku and his crew is happening pretty similar to canon, but Bakugo and Kirishima defeat their villains way faster. Bakugo had Deku as a training partner for 10 months, so his battle prowess is higher than it was at this point in the story in canon. Again, stuff starts going down as it did in canon. Meeting Ida goes for help after 13 is taken down, Nomu attacks and beats down a racer head, but saves Sue just where he's knocked out, and in this timeline, both Kendo and Deku try to knock Shigaraki away from her. While Nomu is able to get in front of both giant punches, the power of Deku's is a bit more than anyone expected. The resulting shockwave from the blow is enough to push Sue and Kendo away and further into the water, while Shigaraki expertly flips away. Unfazed by this, Nomu tries to grab onto Deku's giant metal arm, but smartly, Deku activates the spinning fist mode of the smash hand, causing the monster to be flung away like a bullet. During this, All Might had already arrived and stepped in to save Aizawa, but Deku's strength surprises everyone, causing him to stop for a moment to watch what happens. Shikaraki shows some amazing speed and rushes Deku after he flings Nomu away, but Deku finds himself in a pretty dangerous situation with All Might actually stepping in once again to stop it. Before Shikaraki can be hit full on, Nomu intercepts him, healing from his already small injuries, and the two begin their brawl like in canon. Deku and Kendo easily get Eraserhead out of harm's way and make it to the other students, just as All Might is going for the suplex due to Shikaraki's taunts. Kurogiri still interferes, and when Deku sees this moment, he feels a deep desire to save All Might that pushes him to break a limit. As lopsided as it may look, he is able to create two different builds at the same time and maintain them at a pretty good quality. The Skull Stomper is on his left foot, while a Smash Hand is on his right hand. With a jump that breaks the ground from the force of it, Deku rockets towards All Might and Nomu to save All Might. Kurogiri still appears in front of him, but Bakugo's faster arrival allows him to shut this down and open the path for Deku to save All Might. Once he reaches them, Deku grabs onto Nomu's foot as he rushes by, and the monster is dragged out of Kurogiri's portal and pulled away by Deku at high speed that allows him to free All Might. Deku then flings Nomu as hard as he can with the smash hand towards an adjacent wall, but he's unprepared as the beast corrects his flight and doubles his movement speed by jumping off the wall with a loud boom. His arm outstretches for a high-speed clothesline, and Deku only has a fraction of a second to think. Though the only real thought that really goes through his head is, this is going to be my death, before he covers himself with his smash hand. 
As the two collide, Nomu easily breaks through the reinforced metal and ends up flinging Deku right back the way he came. His blocking and his durability of his quirk, the only thing that afford him to not be cut in half by this clothesline. Midoriya's body bounces and skips off the ground like a rag doll before finally coming to a stop by smashing into the steps that lead to the exit of USJ, where all the class waits. The class president had just saved the number one hero, but at the cost of his own life. Seeing this, Bakugo doesn't even wait and makes good on the threat he made to Kurogiri in canon, and begins unleashing an onslaught of powerful explosions to take the villain down, all while yelling in anguish. Pushed into a speed he wasn't aware he could reach anymore through pure rage, All Might lets go of any sadness, pain, or fatigue he felt as he let one student down and seeing that one was about to cross the line he could not come back from. He rushes forward and grabs Bakugo by his collar and flings him back to get him away from Kurogiri who is by no means getting up anytime soon. He then bulldozes into Nomu and begins wailing down on him big time. If it was absorption and not nullification, then he'd just overload the creature, and better yet, attacking it would allow him to express some of the deep-seated rage he currently felt at losing a student. Using Nomu's rubbery body as a wedge and his fists as unforgiving sledgehammers, All Might digs a huge crater in the ground as he pummels Nomu over and over and over and over again for the death of a young, promising hero. When he's done, the creature is left flattened and smoking, a mess that tries to heal itself unsuccessfully as All Might roars in pure, unadulterated rage. Knowing his job is not done yet, he collects himself and jumps out of the crater as he tries to find the other villain with the hand on his face and the Warp Gate villain, but both are gone. The other UA teachers arrive and begin to attend to the injured and arrest the easily defeated low-level villains. All Might feels his limit approaching and decides he needs to leave for now, even though it pains him to do so. The entirety of Class 1A seem to be trying to get to Deku to see if he's okay, but the other teachers won't let them get to him. All Might approaches and asks what his condition is, and with a heavy heart, Snipe explains that Deku's quirk is keeping him alive at the moment, since it heals him, but he doesn't look so good. In this state, even Recovery Girl cannot save him. All Might hangs his head at those words as they echo through it. His quirk is healing him, but it isn't strong enough. That's it. He has everyone clear the way as he picks him up. Snipe tries to ask him where he's going, and All Might just says to Recovery Girl. Pushing his limits once again, he summons as much speed as possible as he makes to UA and rushes into the infirmary in record time. He is just barely able to hold Deku bridal style as he reverts to his true form. The old lady examines Deku and like Snipe, decides she can't help him. All Might agrees with this idea, but says that together they can definitely save the boy. Recovery Girl realizes what he means and tells him to give her his arm. Making sure he is 100% willing to give it up, she sets about taking a sample of his blood and decides there's no time to check if they have similar blood types. The DNA is all that matters. Pushing the syringe into Izuku's veins, one for all is passed onto him and it begins supercharging his own quirk, making his body and his nanites stronger and allowing them to begin quickly healing the damage already done to him. Playing it safe, Recovery Girl uses her quirk and speeds this up even more. She then gets another reading of the student's vitals and sighs in relief. Looking to the tired and beaten All Might, she announces that Izuku Midoriya will live, and now All Might must raise his new successor. It had been four days since the attack on the USJ and the passing down of the quirk one for all by Toshinori Yagi to Izuku Midoriya. The boy's life had been saved when his original quirk, Nanites, increased the power of its own self-healing abilities through one for all, but he's still not awoken yet. Recovery Girl suspected that his body not only needed time to heal, but he also needed time to adjust as One For All and Nanites interacted with each other. What neither Recovery Girl or All Might had the microscopic vision to see is that at the center of Deku's body, a silver nanite that seemed larger than the rest began to glow a bit brighter. In the canon of Generator Rex, this would be known as the Omega-1 nanite, which allows Rex to control his own nanites and the nanites of others. But as the series does not follow the same rules as the original source material of Generator Rex, we can't operate on the exact same circumstances. So here, as Deku is naturally born with nanites inside his body and not artificially given them, the Omega-1 is just a natural adaptation of his body to better utilize them. Kind of like Bakugo's skin around his hands being naturally more thick so his hands aren't constantly being damaged by his own explosions. 
The Omega One in this universe simply allows to use control of his nanites, and with the addition of One for All, it's been supercharged. So that being said, Deku's body is in a very fragile and unstable state due to his nanites also being in an unstable state themselves, so he needs to be monitored in case the nanites were to go off somewhat or just go out of control and overreact and in some ways resemble cancerous cells. Though it may have saved his life, One For All has powered up Deku's nanites so powerfully that for the first time in his life, it's actually possible for him to become an exponentially variegated organism, or an EVO. Though again, nobody can really see that this is going on, and Deku's body is just kind of doing its own thing right now, but while it's asleep, nothing bad can really happen. So suffice to say, when he finally does wake up, and he realizes that his last memory was seeing Nomu flying towards him, he's really startled. The first person to run to the infirmary would be his mother, who would have been called after the USJ and told the half-truth of Deku being a state too fragile to move to a normal, actual hospital. Because of this, I think the least one of Recovery Girl's infirmary beds could be booked out until Deku was in a safer condition to move. In reality, this is all about no one finding out that All Might had to pass down his own quirk to save Deku's life. And side note, but since it had been a pseudo-hospital room, most of Class 1A had been by to visit Deku in his injured state during the past few days, and his mother had been pretty much staying at the school with him for the last four days as well. Hearing him cry in shock, Inko runs into the room to hug her son, and Izuku, seeing her as the first real familiar thing to him, would reach out towards her to get to her sooner. But as he does, his nanites activate, and he accidentally makes the snipe cannon, and the back of the gun shoots out, fighting a giant hole in the wall and chewing it up into a dense ball, aiming it right towards Inko, who jumps back and screams, just as Deku did as he was crushed by his own weapon. But just in the nick of time, All Might appears in front of the cannon as it fires, easily catching the condensed ball of concrete with his bare hand and laughing triumphantly as he crushes it. He would then go on to harmlessly disable the cannon from off Deku's hand and save the day. Outside of Deku's current fever dream, the heavily bandaged eraser head was panting as he had just barely made it into the room and deactivated Deku's build just in time with his own quirk. As the snipe cannon falls apart, Inko runs to her son and shakes him out of it. Still staring Deku down, Eraser had to ask Inko to go and get All Might and Recovery Girl. This was a problem. About 10 minutes later, All Might and Recovery Girl had arrived from the teachers meeting about the upcoming UA Sports Festival that Aizawa had been heading to when he had to stop and save Inko. Once they get there, Inko and Aizawa are asked to step outside while the two of them handle this, making both Deku's mother and his teacher extremely suspicious about what's going on currently but the best option right now is to let the Jew handle this and then ask questions afterwards. In the infirmary, Deku is filled on all that had happened and what his current situation was, which, under the context, would likely give Deku a near panic attack. But this Deku has settled into himself and into being a hero, as his canon counterpart had at this point in the story, and so I think, just barely, he is able to stay reasonably calm about what he's being told. Then they get to the part about him being named All Might's successor, and he totally has a panic attack. He actually freaks out so bad that his nanites are agitated and accidentally activated once again. This time on his foot, as a skull stomper is formed and nearly does his namesake to Recovery Girl, if not for All Might protecting her by wrapping his body around her and taking the hit. Though the two are kicked through two walls in the process, but thankfully no one is harmed. Now with a giant hole in the infirmary wall, Deku's quirk is once again subdued by Razorhead, and it falls apart causing everyone to sigh in relief, and Deku to begin frantically apologizing as All Might and Recovery Girl return, with All Might laughing and Recovery Girl not being happy. All Might is just barely able to convince Aizawa to step out of the room again, and Deku is given a cup of tea and told to relax, as All Might walks him through everything once again, revealing that Deku should not feel guilty about being given one for all to save his life. Truth be told, ever since the UA entrance exam, All Might had been considering Deku. From their conversation on the rooftop nearly a year ago, he'd virtually already gained All Might's favor. The hero just needed to be absolutely sure and get to know Izuku a bit more. This was originally meant to take place over their time together through his high school career. Some things just don't go as planned, but it's a hero's duty to make a bad situation as far from such as possible. And he truly believed that one day, young Midoriya would do that. When he was done training him, Deku would surpass even him as a hero, and truly embody all the ideals that a hero should embody. And this makes Deku feel much better, downright inspired honestly, still very very nervous and probably about to crack under the pressure, but inspired nonetheless. 
Then, All Might had to go and revert to his true form and run the back of his neck sheepishly, informing Deku that this was the exact reason that it really sucked that he's not going to be able to participate in the upcoming UA Sports Festival. All Might was about to explain when he heard Aizawa's voice through the hole in the wall, and he began to walk into the room. Quickly, All Might reverts back to his muscle form and poses just in time, getting Aizawa to stare him down suspiciously. He then goes on to tell Deku why he would not be allowed in the sports festival. Now, because I'm anticipating that a lot of people will not like this idea that Deku would not get to participate, I'm going to let most people decide why they personally feel that Deku would not be able to participate. My favorite reason is that Principal Nezu and All Might would definitely view Deku as being a little too unstable to participate with other students. He could kill someone if he loses control at the wrong time, or something bad could really happen here. Some may not agree with that reasoning, but either way, Deku just can't participate here. The out of story reason is because with his builds and the versatility of his builds and where Deku's about to go physically with his powers, the sports festival just wouldn't be a challenge for him and he'd win it very, very easily. Once the end story reason is explained, Deku sadly nods and resigns himself to watching the event for another year. Around this time, the infirmary door would burst open as nearly every member of Class 1A rushed in to greet the now awoken Deku showering him in praise of his fight with Nomu, or a totally detailed list of notes about everything Deku had missed in class while hospitalized. And a really loud yell of how he never really was worried about Deku, and now he's four days of class ahead of the nerd. So ha. With that, everyone will be shooed away by Racerhead, who is still deeming Deku too dangerous to be around for everyone right now. And so the next 10 days will pass as most of UA geared for the sports festival. We even still get the interaction of Class 1A and the other classes with Hitoshi Shinso and Tetsu Tetsu standing together and they're calling out of Class 1A, while Bakugo still tells them off, pretty much like in canon. It's possible without the influence of Isuka Kendo in the class, Manoma could have actually risen to the same kind of position as she was and become the head of their class, or I could actually see Shinso doing the same. Meanwhile, taking some time off, All Might would make use of any and all free time to help Deku get used to his body in the new state it's in, and even test out what All One For All had done to his original quirk, power. Power in terms of Deku's builds and his natural physicality had been far increased, so he just had to readjust to it. And during this time, I'm going to say that Deku is able to get his accidental builds to stop appearing by getting his nanites back under somewhat unconscious control. It's just that with the extra power up one for all he's giving them, at any moment they could go out of control if he's not consciously thinking about it or he's not asleep. At the moment, Deku just lacks the ability to do two complicated tasks the way he needs to to completely subconsciously subdue his nanites. Furthermore than that, he can feel that there's something completely different about him. He feels as if there's more he can use to build things with, he just has not gotten a chance to test that out just yet. As for Deku's physicality, well, his natural physical strength without any builds has increased a tiny amount, just like his mild durability and his mild healing factor. They're both a bit stronger now. And in terms of how strong his builds are going to be, common misconception with last part, Deku is actually not strong enough to really do any viable damage against Nomu. I know a lot of people saw him that being able to throw Nomu the way he did and kind of being able to you know, somewhat react to him made them think, oh, wow, Deku's really strong here. But he really wasn't. He just kind of caught Nomu off guard and threw him while just using the power of his own smash hands to kind of throw Nomu. Other than that, he wasn't that strong and didn't do any significant damage to Nomu. Here though, if Deku were to take on Nomu once again, he would definitely do better. That's all I'll say for now. And once the sports festival would finally begin, Deku would resign himself to watching it, though he would not take the time off completely. While watching, he would try and think up of any builds he has currently or that could be made later down the line that could help him in any of the events that he watched while he'd also be cheering on his friends. Now, even though the canon of the story, some of the events in the sports festival were chosen at random, because to my knowledge in the main manga Horikoshi has written, we haven't seen any other sports festival events than we did in the first actual sports festival we saw in the manga, so that means obstacle race, cavalry battle, and then battles at the end. Because of this, I won't be making up any events because bleh, that's too fanfictiony. We'll just stick with those two events and act as if, even though in this timeline they came up random and came up as those two events, so I'd have to invent anything myself. Now with Deku not in attendance of the sports festival, Todoroki would not make a declaration of war towards him, and wouldn't make Bakugo jealous because of it. That said, nothing has really happened in this timeline that would not make Bakugo motivated. In fact, in this timeline, I could see him definitely being even more fired up, since he doesn't get to compete against Deku. He was going to win this competition and rub it in Deku's face. He wouldn't be useless like he was in USJ when Deku nearly 
He didn't care about that anymore. The only thing that mattered right now was his winning. In the obstacle race, it would start off as in canon with Bakugo's reaction and initial start time coming in just a small fraction faster than in canon due to his being a bit stronger and having more general experience through training with Deku for almost 10 months. He and Todoroki would soon find themselves both vying for the first place spot, while at home, Deku is watching and taking notes. He'd have been thinking about a build for quicker lateral movement, but something like a vehicle, not something for just simple jumping like he did with Skull Stompers. In an event like this one, that would make him reign supreme. Trying to sketch out a design for this build, he actually gets kind of sad that Mei Hatsume is not available for him to talk to since she actually could be a pretty good help right now. But then he'd realize that she's actually competing in front of his eyes on TV and would tune right back in, rooting them all on. And by the way, I think it's possible to allow Mei to actually do a bit better in the race than she did in canon. She's been in the workshop with Deku, who in this version is really, really good with machines and machinery in general, and studying his builds could help her improve her own support items that she'll be using right now. Not to say she'll just be busting out her own versions of Deku's builds or anything like that, especially not at this point in time, but her things are definitely more efficient and more durable for sure. But in the last legs of the obstacle race, it would go as it did in canon, and without the interference of Deku in this time. Now, even in canon, after Deku had gotten in front of Bakugo and Todoroki, Todoroki came in second. In this timeline, I really, really, really wanted to give to Bakugo, though, because he is likely a bit faster and a bit stronger, and those two have been neck and neck the entire time with a canon version of Bakugo, who was not this strong. So, Bakugo wins this time, coming in first place, with Todoroki coming in second place. From there, since everyone really hasn't had that many changes to their current power levels or their current stats in the timeline, we'll just move everyone up one spot, since Deku is not there, until you reach the 41st place, where here in this timeline, Mei Hatsume is 40th instead of Manga Fukudashi. Moving on, we move into the Calvary battle, and Ida would likely still have the same ideology as in canon, where he wants to kind of do this on his own. Todoroki still came in second, so I don't see him changing up his analysis of the current situation and who he's going to need on his team too much. And here, Bakugo would have the most points in the game and everyone would have a pretty good understanding of his quirk, so he'd have a lot of offers for who he should team up with though I think he would definitely accept Hiroshima's as his strong front horse idea would really, really rev Bakugo up. In this event, I think that Bakugo will want to be the indisputable champion of the game, and to him, that might mean making sure that no one else has any points by the time the game ends. So having a team that can take hits and dish him out and move around really, really quickly is going to be vital to him. Taking this to account, I think Uraraka, who remember is someone Bakugo has spent a lot of his time with in this timeline, since in this timeline she has a very similar relationship to Bakugo as she does to Deku and Ida. He's someone that she views as being closer to in the class. Thinking on her feet, she promises Bakugo that with their powers combined, they'll have the speed and maneuverability to get all around the field and take all the points they could ever want. Once again, this entices Bakugo, who decides to take her on. And now, with only one spot left and a lot of his classmates still vying for that spot and having to tell him what their quirks and names were once again, he actually announces that he has his own idea as he stares down Siro, who had just told him what his power was. Hearing this, Uraka slightly accuses him of being like Deku, which gets her life threatened. At home, Deku is still thinking about this lateral movement build. This would definitely be good for this event as well. He could actually put his teammates on top of the build with him and maybe just have those who could fire long range attacks for him or protect him from the flanks and sides while he drove them all around the stadium. As soon as he got back to school, he had to get with Power Loader and May about this and see what they could come up with. Now sadly, because the things have turned out in this timeline, I don't know who May would team up with and they would likely not be able to help her secure many points, so I think after this she would be out of the competition. Team Todoroki would set their sights on Team Bakugo, which is actually going to be a pretty good battle. Bakugo's team has the ability to make themselves weightless and then fly using Bakugo's quirk, while also being able to stick to the ground and kind of steer themselves with Sero's quirk, so it's a very, very, very quick team. Meanwhile, Todoroki's team is still just the perfect combination of quirks, making this supreme juggernaut of speed, defense, long-range attacks, what have you. I think for the majority of the fight, Team Bakugo would not do too much running, instead trying to take out Team Todoroki. I think this would pretty much result in a stalemate for the majority of the entirety of the cavalry battle, with Team Monoma and other things not really happening around Team Bakugo, and other teams really just trying to vie for some spot that wasn't going to be number one or number two. Trying to play it smart. 
Finally, Ida would reveal his trump card in the Recipro, and with that, I think he would steal the 10 million points from Bakugo right off his head. If this were to happen, even with Team Bakugo's impressive maneuverability, I do not think they could successfully catch up to Team Todoroki and remove the headband in time. Meaning to win now, they either have to set their sights on weaker teams, or bet on the points they had left. But Bakugo rejects both these ideas, explaining he had one last gamble to get the 10 million back. With a hasty explanation, the whole team hesitantly agrees, and they all hunker down, as Sarah attaches the most rubbery tape he can to the ground. Uraraka then makes the entire team weightless, as Bakugo has Kirishima and the others hold him as he begins releasing very powerful explosions that push them back over and over, pulling the tape taut and ready to spring them forward. Part 2 of the plan will begin, as Kirishima creates a foothold in his hands and gives Bakugo a boost up, who then calls back to his teammates that he see him on the other side as the tape pulls taut and slingshots them forward. Already moving forward at pretty high speed towards Team Todoroki, the weightless Sero, Uraraka, and Kirishima brace themselves as Kirishima activates his quirk, and Uraraka releases her ability, making their weight come back and increase their velocity. With Ida currently out of commission, he cannot get them out of the way, and so Team Todoroki has to stay and face their opponents. Todoroki would erect a wall of ice, only for Kirishima to come bursting through it in his hardened state, with the other two behind him. But luckily, the ice was enough to slow them down for a small amount of time, and with that, Denki Garinari is allowed to use his powers and shock them, putting them out of commission. Under an insulated blanket made by Yayorozu, Todoroki realizes something. Where's Bakugo? Todoroki has his thought just in time to hear an explosion up above and look up to see Bakugo dive bombing straight down towards them. Panicking, his first instinct is to bring a hand up and shoot a small jet of flame towards Bakugo to hopefully veer him off course. But, as Bakugo has been trained with Deku in this timeline, I think he would have even better skill at maneuvering in midair, and would very easily dodge the flame and would actually land on top of Team Todoroki, snatching Todoroki's headband away before a line of Sero's tape on his back pulled taut and yanked him right back over to Team Bakugo, who, even though they had been shocked, were just barely on their feet still. But by this time, I think that the time allotted for the cavalry battle would run out. Todoroki is sweating, as he really didn't mean to use his flames, especially against Bakugo. So on top of being in shock, pretty much, he's also pretty mad. Thankfully, as in canon, Yayorozu would have had the idea to switch their headbands around, so Bakugo would not have gotten the 10 million points. That said, I do think that Team Bakugo would have enough points to at least pass and go on to the next round. So, just for simplicity's sake, Team Todoroki would still be in first place, Team Bakugo is now in second place, and Bakugo is furious. Team Tetsu Tetsu is in third. In this timeline, I think it would be very hard for Shinso to get anyone in Class 1B to fall under his quirk. In these types of events, I just don't see Shinso doing very well unless you give him a team completely comprised of non-Class 1B members who are also extremely powerful, which there just aren't that many of. So finally, Team Kendo would come in 4th place, and as in the original story, their team was slated at 4th place for a good while before Team Midoriya pulled an upset and Shinso wouldn't be doing anything as well, so nothing really changes here for them. Though, Team Kendo would be made up for completely different characters in this timeline, likely some of the ones we just aren't talking about here. Moving on, we would finally reach the final round, and the problem here is two things. I don't know all the members of Team Tetsu Tetsu or Team Kendo to even throw into drawing for matches. The only people we know for sure are this version of Team Bakugo, Team Todoroki, as well as Tetsu Tetsu and Kendo, and that leaves six unknown competitors. And secondly, I still have the issue of most of my audience not being manga readers, and the quirks of 14 members of Class 1B not being shown in the anime as of this time of recording. I'm still committed to not giving manga spoilers when the majority of my viewers are anime only, so once again, I will encourage you all to pick up the manga as it's a very good story and worth the read. Maybe later in the anime's run, I can come back to this video and add a video on top of it that goes more in depth with these possible matchups to see if there's anything I can really do with it there, but it will only be in the future. If that video is made, it should be popping up in the iCard on the top right hand of the corner of the screen right now. But the what if must go on, and with all these unknowns, I think the most reliable way to do these matchups without spoiling anybody and yet have a logical outcome would be to skip to the most logical outcome regarding the final match. Even though it may be kind of boring considering canon, I think it will be Bakugo versus Todoroki in the finals. They are just in a league of their own at this point in the story, and they have the most combat ability, especially Bakugo, who has been sparring and training with Deku with his builds for almost 10 months in this timeline. Now, midway through the finals, Tenya Ida would receive a phone call informing him that his older brother has been attacked and is currently in the hospital. Now, before we get to the actual fight, there are a few other factors to consider here in this timeline compared to the original. Number one, this would be an extremely angry Todoroki. Right now, he was one-on-one -on -one concerning the event and the sports festival, 
and his single win had not been an outright victory where Bakugo had really been a thorn in his side and was continuing to be so. Not to mention he actually ended up using his father's quirk in front of his father. Imagine the lecture Endeavor would give him. So Shoto, you've finally given up that silly little declaration and seen reason. Well good. It's about time you grew up and accepted your destiny to overcome that fool All Might. Now we can finally get down to business and teach you how to control it. Todoroki would have been ridiculously angry, and imagine how he would feel when Bakugo was confirmed as his opponent in the finals. The guy that has been brash, rude, and annoying, a thorn in his side for the entire day, after nearly not even being on his radar this entire time, and even making him use his father's quirk? Ugh! We rarely see Todoroki extremely emotional, but here, he would definitely be visibly upset. By this time, Bakugo would likely be less upset than he was originally when he first came in second in the cavalry battle with his team. He'd definitely still be somewhat upset and high strung over not winning, but now he'd finally get a shot at Todoroki just one on one and not some kind of event or race. This was just a fight, individual skills and power going head to head, and he knew he was better. At home, Deku was on the edge of his seat as this match is about to begin. He watched as the two faced off, Todoroki on one side scowling down Bakugo who held a vicious grin of its own as he revved up his hands with small explosions. As soon as Cementos gave the signal for the match to begin, both competitors made a move simultaneously. Bakugo blasted himself forward, while Todoroki made the largest ice power he could in Bakugo's direction, having anticipated Bakugo's move. Quicker than Todoroki expected him to, Bakugo redirects himself in the explosion, causing his body to roll to the left in the nick of time. Shoto would then lean down and slam his palm into the ground, making an even larger barrage of ice fire towards Bakugo, who knowing he could not dodge this time, skids to a stop and begins exploding himself a hole through the large barrage of ice. Digging himself out, he once again began his rushdown, while Todoroki constantly refused to use his flame, allowing Bakugo to grab him by his shirt and hair, flipping him and throwing him nearly out of bounds. Todoroki's eyes would erect a slide behind him and save him, while Bakugo would snarl at him and demand that he use his flames and not hold back on him. Todoroki would angrily refuse, and I think with tension so high, he would go a bit into detail about why he would not. With a good bit of distance between them, Todoroki once again makes a huge wall of ice to rush towards Bakugo, slowing himself down even more with the frost. Snarling, Bakugo grabs his own arm as reinforcement and releases a bone-shaking explosion that destroys a good chunk of the ice and causes a small shockwave to blow through the arena. Bakugo would then go on a tirade about Todoroki holding back, very similar to Deku's canon version, but a lot more aggressive and disrespectful. I think if similar feelings of inspiration were felt, but also include Todoroki's current festering anger, that he would still be pushed into using his flames, but more out of anger than friendly competition in this timeline. He's trying to shut Bakugo up. As flames consume his left side, Todoroki calls out fine and lifts his hand, shooting off a huge god of flame that Bakugo once again nearly avoids. Like we would see in his fight against Stain and Cannon, Todoroki will have some trouble with opponents who can move swiftly and agilely in a lateral direction something that Deku couldn't do in their canon fight, allowing Bakugo an advantage over Todoroki. And considering that, I'm gonna say that we're in a stalemate, with Todoroki's defense and range keeping Bakugo at bay, and Bakugo's agility keeping him from taking any blows that would really do significant damage. But both would soon realize that a battle of attrition is Todoroki's to win. With Todoroki using his flames and his eyes here, he's not gonna have the same stamina problems as canon. That said, Bakugo had way more maneuverability and attack power, not to mention his stamina is by no means bad. The finals match between Katsuki Bakugo and Shoto Todoroki raged on as explosions, ice, and gouts of flame flew wildly in their battle dance. Bakugo's maneuvering and dodging was finally beginning to wear his body down, and soon he'd be too tired to dodge or attack. Likewise, while switching between ice and flame was keeping his temperature more regulated than usual, Quirks had a physical limit and stamina cost to the use, like any other physical ability, and as such, having to push himself to switch between elements with so little practice and at such speed to keep Bakugo out of his bubble had also taken a toll on Todoroki's mana gauge. And so, both come to the conclusion that they have to end the match with their next move or else they'd lose. Predictably, Bakugo turns his palms to the ground and blows himself forward at a high speed, and he does so with a plan. As much as he didn't like it, his time training with this timeline's Midoriya had given him a better mind for on-the-fly tactics for battle. Shoto would directly anticipate this opening move, and stomp with his right side, erupting the largest block of ice he could towards Bakugo, who likely wouldn't be able to maneuver at such a high speed. Instead, Bakugo would place both palms in front of him, and roar as he unleashes a large explosion that is enough to destroy the block of ice. This also pushes Todoroki back with a shockwave, as black soot and mist from the hot air cloud the arena, making it very hard for even Todoroki to see. But on instinct, he's able to make an ice block behind him that keeps him in bounds. Smartly, he'd ignite his left side, which would illuminate a short distance around him to see if Bakugo was planning to blindside him. Every now and then, he'd send out a burst of flame to sweep the area, but Bakugo hadn't approached. 
Then finally, something burst through the smoke, and knowing that using flames against Bakugo while his hands were sweaty could definitely hurt him very much, he decides to take a gamble and still shoots a huge flame towards the oncoming object, only to find that it was Bakugo's UAPE shirt. This realization came in tandem with a bright blinding light going off near him, making him drop his flames to cover his eyes. This was Bakugo's stun grenade. By this time, the smoke was clearing up, but it was too late. He felt a sweaty yet strong right hand grab his left, and his vision would clear away to reveal the snarling grin of Bakugo. The message was clear. Use your flames and risk blowing your hand apart. Use your ice and I'll blow your hand apart. At home, Izuku is kind of shocked at the well-executed plan. Todoroki and Bakugo stared at each other before the recommendation student would raise his right hand and formally forfeit the match as the stadium went wild. Bakugo would then let his hand go and stomp away. Todoroki would follow after him and tell him that he knew Bakugo fractured his arms. He usually didn't use such big explosions when he didn't have his costume on. That last huge one was a doozy. Then he'd use the stun grenade afterwards, so the fracture probably got worse after that. That was why he didn't punch or hit him instead of waiting for him to give up. Bakugo would just scoff and ignore Todoroki, who tells him to go get himself patched up before the award ceremony, while Bakugo just growls that he pisses him off. Shoto quietly says right back at you, but he keeps walking beside Bakugo. At the end of the sports festival, we would still see Bakugo in first, Todoroki in second, and Tokuyami in third. But unlike in canon, Bakugo is virtually completely calm. He fought at full power and received Todoroki's full power in exchange. His only issue is that he was unable to just purely overpower Todoroki. It just meant that he still had people to get better than, hence his lack of boisterous gloating or boasting about the win. Two days later, Class 1A would all be patched up and ready for normal school days to resume. This includes the formerly out of commission Izuku Midoriya, who we open up on trying out his brand new vehicle build without a name. He'd been blueprinting this build since the Swords Festival, and afterwards, he finally got in touch with Hatsume and asked her opinion on it, and now was his first and best chance to try it out. The issue was, he by no means was confident enough to push it any faster than around the speed of a bicycle. And the other issue was, unregulated quirk use was a crime, so he was currently driving through alleyways and backways on a route to school. Like in canon, he'd run to Ida, and he would definitely be aware of the incident in Hosu City with Ingenium, and Ida would still be just as closed off as in canon though he would scold his class rep for breaking the law, making Deku think he may just be all right. Once in class, Midnight would still be needed to oversee the students, choosing their hero names. This event would go virtually the exact same as in canon, except for Deku's choice of name here. Remember, in the canon of this timeline, he does not receive the nickname Deku by Bakugo, as he wasn't really bullied by him. I just referred to him as such for simplicity, so Uraraka would never even have the chance to make Deku more fond of the name. Instead, in this timeline, Deku has currently had his powers for nearly a year now, and I believe that he would have came up with multiple epithets and hero names. His nanites allow him to generate machines out of his body parts, so he'd choose the name, Nanite Hero, Generator. And I think Midnight would instantly sign off on this name, as well as Bakugo actually cracking a small smirk at it. Aizawa would still elaborate on internships, and the students would begin making decisions on who they would be making their internships with. Though Midoriya did not participate in the sports festival, I believe All Might's old teacher would have sought to mentor the ninth holder one for all. And so, All Might would appear at 1A's door to speak with Deku about this, an event that would go virtually the exact same as in canon except for Deku mentioning that he initially wanted to intern under Power Load. This would make All Might feel a bit bad as he realized that Deku had gained a lot from his colleague, but he assures Deku that Gran Torino wouldn't have put in a request if he didn't plan to help Deku drastically improve. This way is Deku, but he decides he wants to go and at least ask Power Loader if he'll be extremely busy during the week. He'd like to be able to at least email him if he came up with a build or a concept or an idea to modify one. Once at the support course workshop, he'd find that Power Loader was indeed on the list of 40 heroes willing to take in interns. But he'd actually put in a request for Mei, Momo, and Izuku. But he does understand that there was a higher hero willing to take him on, and he respects Deku's drive to get better. With that, we can skip to when Aizawa will be saying goodbye to his students, and Deku and Uraraka telling Ida if he needs them to pick up his phone. Ida would give a fake smile and begin to walk away, but before he could get too far, he'd hear Bakugo call him by his root nickname of Four Eyes. Turning around, he'd have Bakugo order him not to die. Deku finds this weird, but he doesn't question it. However, he would come to regret not doing so soon. From here, the students would begin arriving to their internships, with most being the exact same as in canon, other than Yayirozu, who will be spending the week with Power Loader, not Uobami. This includes Bakugo going to the agency of the number four hero, Best Genus. Even though Bakugo was by no means rowdy at the sports festival, I do think the number four would still take an interest in Bakugo. I want to try and improve his personality. Though it would not be as rambunctious or aggressive, his style would still be kind of unsightly to Best Genus. That said, I believe with a small bit of tech that Bakugo had gained through this timeline, he could convince Best Genus to teach him some skills outside of appearance and etiquette. He would pretty much still do so through a basic tantrum, but as he wasn't as unsightly at the festival, Genus would cave and decide to help Bakugo with one of the small faults he saw in his quirk use. It seemed like Bakugo only had a single move that could be used to stop an opponent without actually harming them in his stun grenade technique. That just wouldn't do. A hero always needed a technique that could keep their clothes nice and clean. 
And beyond this, Best Genius is a hero less focused on straight combat and more focused on restraining opponents. So he would offer to help improve Bakugo's stamina and open his mind to a brand new way of using his quirk. Meanwhile, Deku would have arrived to Gran Torino's home and been introduced to the eccentric retiree. Think the old man is nuts? Deku would attempt to leave, and as he tries to do so, Gran Torino would drop his act and asks Deku what it won for all done to his original quirk. Deku is pretty shocked at the quick change of personality before Gran Torino switches right back. It doesn't take long before Midori is convinced to get out of his costume, which would be the newer costume beta version he received after his original was destroyed. This time, it was just torn to shreds at the USJ when he was hit by Nomu. Remember, he kind of ragdolled against the ground at high speed, which isn't great for clothes. At first, Torino's speed is still too much for Deku. He had decided to grant the old man's wish in not holding back while on his home, and creates his favorite build for the sparring match, a pair of smash hands, and begins trying to predict where his new mentor will attack from to counter him and hit him with a big punch but he's much too slow. Torino would tell him this and urge him to quit using the power he had a good handle on and try using one for all. The power isn't as special as he thinks it is. After being hit a few more times, Deku secretly takes his advice and would take a swipe at Torino only for it to be dodged. But in the next instant, Deku would activate one for all and attempt to control the 5% his body could handle, focusing it inside his arms. This actually creates enough energy that both his mash hands were actually broken and it sends his mechanical fists flying towards the old man. Panicking and thinking that he's gone too far, Deku loses focus and loses the one for all energy in his arms, only for Gran Torino to dodge both the mechanical fists that had been launched at him and let them sail past him, planting themselves in the wall behind him, as he kicked and planted his foot in Deku's face and Deku's back on the ground. Torino would compliment Generator's ingenuity, but he's much too slow still. He'd elaborate and try and push Deku's thoughts towards the place he wants them to go. He mentions that he heard at the USJ, Deku used two different builds at the same time to fight a creature that was nearly All Might's level without one for all. But the issue with his big powerful builds was that they were very unsuited to take on small, nimble opponents who were also powerful as well. There was absolutely no way that he could succeed All Might if he could only be effective against one type of enemy. If he didn't change how he thought of and use one for all and remove those shackles, then they need to find a 10th holder fast. This gets Deku thinking as Torino leaves him alone to go and buy dinner. Looking around the room, Deku realizes the mess they'd made of it and does his best to fix what he can, like using Technopathy to fix the microwave and sweeping up dirt and debris and all the while thinking about what was said. The issue with agile enemies was completely true. Even during his training with Bakugo, this had been an issue. Granted, training together had only improved Bakugo's maneuvering, making him a near master at mid-air movement with explosions, and Gran Torino himself was a pro capable of training All Might, so it wasn't like he was losing to just random off-the-street criminals. And while with Bakugo, Deku had come to get better and better at countering him, Gran Torino had just shown he wasn't that good. And now, thinking back, he'd never actually beaten Bakugo on their spars because of his lack of speed with his builds, both switching speed and their clunkiness. This meant he had a huge flaw. This left him with one objective and two possible routes. The goal was to find a faster way of fighting. He could do this by learning to switch between All for One and Nanites, or possibly create a new build that could be used for smaller opponents. He'd been thinking of such designs since he discovered this new material his nanites could produce that was lighter and faster than his regular green builds were. Remember, this is actually a problem that Rex and Cannon actually faced. His fastest most agile build was the BFS before he unlocked the Omega-1 builds. And keep in mind, Deku has only had around a year of experience with builds, while Rex had nearly a decade at the very least. Way more time than Deku had. That said, I believe that initially Deku would attempt to learn better control over One For All and develop more surprise switches between One For All and Nanites, like what he had just used against Gran Torino, and he decides to do this that night. Like in canon, his training exercise is jumping like Mega Man X. He summons the Skull Stompers on his legs and does his best to summon the 5% of One For All that he could control to his arms. While clumsy and unrefined, I think he would actually be able to do it in this timeline, maybe after two or three tries. Remember, focusing an ability to a single part of the body would be pretty natural to him at this point, like it being a similar process deciding to which build he wants to make and what body part to put it on. Just kind of the same synopsis firing when he wants to say, okay, now I want to put the smash hands on my hands, now I want to put the skull stompers on my feet, so on and so forth. This would mean that he's actually finding a way to use both his powers at once, just independently of each other. But until he becomes more efficient at using one for all without injury, then using builds in one for all at the same time just isn't that viable. But he has to admit, the idea of enhancing his speed while using smash hands or living smashes while using the skull stompers was very enticing the closest he could think of to getting towards who All Might would be. The next day, Gran Torino and he would get back to work with more sparring, and Deku, though tired, shows some major improvement, already channeling one for all into his legs and nearly swatting Torino out of the air with the smash hits, only for him to just barely graze him and still be knocked back into a wall. Impressed, Gran Torino would really compliment the idea, but it was still unsuited for an opponent like him. For now, though, they'd take a bite to eat as a package arrives for Gran Torino. He'd happily open his new microwave, 
only for Deku to mention that he used his powers to fix the original one and subsequently get chewed out by the old man for letting him waste his money. After this, Deku would still make their lunch in the old microwave but with a massive plate, would have the epiphany of using one for all on his entire body, but it wouldn't come out the exact same way and here is kind of understandable about why he would not have thought about using one for all like this for a very long time. For one, he's only had the power for a few weeks, and for another, the last time he let a quirk run through his entire body, he became a giant monster and it took the power of All Might to stop him. This would likely become a huge mental barrier for him and probably make it very hard for him to even switch between builds since he'd always be afraid of that in the back of his mind. That latent fear that he could just lose it at any time and become a danger to the public would always hold him back. That is, until he learned how to control an awesome power like Nanites. And remember, one for all and Nanites could still be accessed as totally different quirks of each other, meaning full body use was possible. It was also the key to unlocking a whole lot of other abilities, like the dual use of one for all and Nanites over his entire body, the dual use of separate builds, or maybe full body builds. Compared to the issue of turning into a giant robot monster, One For All was a much safer quirk to practice with, and so One For All full cowling and a full variations of it are born, and begin being trained with in sparring matches with Gran Torino. Meanwhile in Hosu City, Tenya Ida continues to patrol with normal hero Manuel, while looking for the perpetrator of his brother's attack, Hero Killer Stain, who is currently meeting with the League of Villains after Tomo Shigaraki would try to recruit him. Though here, Kuragiri is much more injured when transporting Stain to the hideout. Remember, Bakugo injured him at the USJ. I think he'd be in the condition to transport Stain, but he's in no shape to fight. While Shigaraki isn't really injured at all. If this were to happen, I believe in their initial scuffle, Shigaraki would still pretty much be overpowered, but drag the fight out a lot more and get damaged a lot further by Stain, who comes to respect Shigaraki a bit as he does land a hit on him getting a bit of his skin to crack on. Stain would agree to join up, but for now he has to be returned to Hosu as he is not done with his work yet. R4-1 agrees to give Shigaraki three of the currently available Nomus, and Gran Torino decides to take Deku out to fight different types of opponents. This sets the stage as things being very similar to canon, so a Nomu would still attack the train, and Deku would get involved and jump off the train and activate his vehicle build, having no qualms at heading off at full speed towards the destruction of Hosu City. Even his initial encounter with Stain would be the exact same as in canon, Though here before the boy can be killed, the sound of a strange kind of engine rings out, and there is Deku, using his full cowling, mode unnamed build. Seeing the situation, Deku would break his legs out of the build as he rockets forward and decks the villain across the face, knocking him back even further than he did in canon. The initial dialogue would be pretty similar as Deku weighs his options. With the smash hands, he thinks he'll definitely be able to get both the injured hero and Ida out of the alleyway and hopefully go and find a pro, but as precaution, he still sends out a mysterious group text with his location. A group text to Hiroki, who is also in Hosu City because Endeavor was in Hosu City, sees, but nearly ignores as he does not know Deku as well in this timeline. That is, until he would see Bakugo responding to this message angrily multiple times, only for Deku to not respond. That warrants an investigation. After sending his text, Deku does the best he can with charging up more nanites and activates the smash hands. This puts him in full cowling, mode smash. With his massive mechanical hand, he easily scoops up Ida before lunging to grab the other hero. But surprising him with both speed and power, Stain intercepts him and slashes at his build, putting a huge gash in his mechanical arm. The hero killer then expertly transitions this attack into a mid-air dropkick that sent Deku skidding back. After a while, Stain is able to damage the smash hand. In a cannon fight with his mentor, Agent 6, Rex's smash hand was actually damaged by Six's blade. This is significant because we know two things. Number one, Six was actually holding back in this fight, making Rex think that he would actually kill him when he was not really going for it. And the other thing, because of the scaling of My Hero Academia, we know for a fact that Stain is definitely stronger and a lot faster than Agent 6. The shock from being countered so easily actually makes Deku drop Ida, as he hadn't been expecting this. Before he could retaliate, a throwing knife is thrown right where his face is, and full cowling is the only thing that gives him the speed to dodge to the left just in time, getting his cheek cut. Looking back to Stain, he realizes that he is already on top of him with his tongue ready to take in the fresh blood he just spilt. Refusing to give up, Deku breaks his arms out of his build and uses them to stiff arm Stain and stop his momentum. He then grabs onto Stain's scarf and slams his forehead into the hero killer, hoping to stun him. The opposite of what he expected, Stain grins maniacally as both of them had split the skin above their eyes and began to bleed profusely. At this range, Deku cannot stop him and Stain licks up his blood, and like a rag doll, the Nanite hero falls paralyzed. Praising him as a real hero, Stain decides to spare him and begins moving towards Native to end his life first. But then, a god of flame impedes his progress, and he has to avoid it as Todoroki arrives. Deku gives his hypothesis about Stain's quirk, which the villain rewards by confirming that the time limit is based off blood type. Meanwhile, Best Genius argues with Bakugo about going to Hosu. 
Finally, he caves in and decides that the two of them and a few members of his agency would rush over there and provide help to the heroes. Back in Hosu, Todoroki defends the group solo until Deku's time limit is up. He would still have his dialogue with Ida, though unlike in canon, Stain has been much more impressed with Deku, to the point he is gunning for Todoroki much more aggressively. His trick with throwing his sword up to let Todoroki here is replaced with the sword being thrown and followed by a thrust of one of his knives towards the boy's gut. Seeing this, the world slows down for Generator. With adrenaline high and his urge to protect someone roaring in his body, he would naturally rely on his initial quirk more than his secondary one. But the full body and full cowling would only enhance this. On instinct, his mind created a build perfectly suited to protecting someone from far away, and the two gauntlet-like objects form on Deku's arms. These two objects project a strange energy, which are actually just hypercharged atoms. Reaching his hand towards Todoroki, the energy fades from the gauntlets and reappears in a bubble around his classmate. In the canon of Generator X, this build is known as Block Party, and Deku has just come up with it on pure instinct alone. Stain is shocked as his knife shatters on the force field, and even more so when Deku plows into him with an undisciplined shoulder check. With a moment to breathe, Todoroki pulls some of the throwing knives that were lost in his arm out and asks Deku how he's doing this, and the other boy asks him to fight now and don't look a gift horse in the mouth since he has no idea. Stan would once again launch into fighting the two, noting that Deku is no longer bleeding from his cuts. In fact, they seem to have stopped bleeding completely, almost as if he's already healed. When attacked directly, the energy bubble disappears from Todoroki, and the energy returns to the shield form on Deku's gauntlets, as he blocks every slash he could, struggling to keep up, and listening to Todoroki's warning on dodging. Nowhere near as experienced as Stain, Majora would screw up and not only have his gauntlet damaged when Stain would smash the handle of his sword into it, and instead of slashing at it, forced it to swing down as Stain flipped back and speared his metal spiked shoe into the gauntlet, and Deku's arm actually under it. This causes the shield on that arm to disappear and fall apart, and with one shield, Deku tries blocking, but he is easily cut once again and his blood is licked by Stain. He then heads towards Todoroki once again, intent on bisecting him. Generator is stunned by Stain's quirk, while Shoto is stunned by his speed, and both boys dread the next second. But just then, Ida regains control over his body and zooms forward to save Todoroki. With room made, Todoroki tries to blast Stain again, and keep him from getting too close, but we all know how the next bit of this would go. Regaining control of his body, Deku releases his new shield build, as he still had no idea how he made it, though he does have enough stamina to shroud himself in full cowling one more time. The new build being made of that blue metal instead of the usual green had apparently drained his nanites for the moment. With this, Stain is defeated the exact same way as in canon, while Endeavor and Gran Torino finish off nearly every noble in the city, except the one that flies. Though here in this timeline, there is one more major change of this part, that as the tired Deku is not carried off by the winged Nomu, it wouldn't even get a chance. The creature is quickly binded up by denim threads, leading back to the number four hero, and is easily restrained. Stain would wake back up and try to resume the fight to the exact same ending as in canon. Later in Hosu City Hospital, Bakugo will be angry at not participating in the fight with Stain, and will be asking his classmates for details on it. The boys will be told of their law breaking and be let off for the warning. Once the adults had left, it was just the four students of Class 1A in their hospital room. Looking over to Ida, Deku asks a question. Would he mind if he named his new vehicle build the Ingenium Engine? And Ida says yes, he'd like that a lot. And we resume our tale with the first term final exam arc, which virtually has no changes that are worth mentioning. Remember Bakugo and Deku are a lot closer relationship-wise to their current selves in the manga than what they had been at this point in canon. Beyond that, Deku still has nanites along with one for all here, and he and Bakugo have trained together before, so their cooperation is stronger. Though since Mineta isn't in the class, we can simply replace him with Kendo, having her work with Sero, and likely still beat Midnight a lot easier, considering she and Tetsu Tetsu are able to hold back Mustard, who arguably has an equally dangerous quirk and uses it in a more lethal way than Midnight does. So those two would also do better than Sero and Mineta did in canon. And I think with her friendship, with Deku and Meihatsume in this timeline, as well as being one of Power Lotus' apprentices, that Momo is going to be having the confidence issue she did in canon, so her and Todoroki also do better. After the exams, Deku begins to feel a little sick, which is odd since nanites have always prevented any kinds of colds or such. However, the symptoms come and go very rarely, so he pays it little mind. Next, the events of the training camp take place, and these would very likely change in some major ways. For one, Bakugo doesn't act in any ways which can attract the League to think he could be twisted into a villain in the first place. So instead, the forest camp is simply made into the next site where the up-and-coming heroes will be ambushed like at the USJ. This isn't very creative on the League of Villains part, but the isolated location and urgency of the message from the UA spy makes this somewhat desperate plan necessary. A lot of things will still go as in canon though, as it's mostly just the Vanguard action squad being backed up by Shigaraki and Kurogiri and a few more ready Nomu I'd say. However, with both a stronger Class 1A 
and B, their teachers, and the Wild Wild Pussycats. The tide of battle begins to slowly turn in the hero's favor, with the villains having no intention of retreating until it's too late, and necessitating that All For One himself make an appearance to get Shigaraki out of harm's way. Deku, though terrified, reveals that he and All Might plan for such an event, and he activates a special emergency signal build, which instantly alerts All Might personally that Deku has encountered a foe he can't beat on his own and it sends the number one hero rushing to his location at top speed. All for one decides he wants to play with Deku a little, so it's a cat and mouse game to survive for about five minutes until All Might finally arrives, which pushes all the heroes to the extreme. So this is effectively a mixing of the training camp arcs and Kamino arcs, really only being differed by their timing and locations. That means the events of All Might and All for One's final round remain the same, however and upon learning that All Might has to retire, Deku's mood is further dampered by the symptoms of his mysterious cold, growing a bit more severe and showing themselves a tad more frequently. We would then be able to move on to the original license exam arc, and this is yet another arc that can't change very effectively. However, it is quite possible that due to our Class 1A changes and developments that Deku and Momo could form a very easy way for their entire class to win passage into the second round by creating like special ball launchers and using the block party build. And with Bakugo more cooperative, it's even more possible. This then very easily leads us into our first encounter with the Big Three and the Shy Heisekai arc. The League and Yakuza's first meeting goes very similar as well, while the way Mirio sizes up each member of 1A doesn't really change very much. The Heisekai arc arguably could change in a very massive way, since Deku can use nanites and is already hellbent on saving air, he could simply partially form a build, break off some of the pieces, and then plant it on the girl to act as a tracker, effectively negating the time the heroes had to wait in order to ensure they didn't jump the gun. If this were to happen, the Yakuza could be raided before before Shigaraki and Overhaul reconvene, meaning the Yakuza would be down two powerful helpers in Toga twice, and thus making the raid easier overall. There's also the fact that with all of Class 1A passing their provisional license exam, a lot more of our main characters could be involved in the raid. And in as much as I would like to have the character happily avoided, Mirio will still sacrifice his quirk in order to stay there. Now, Deku vs. Overhaul could actually be a massive change, and would like in canon be Deku's highest feat of scaling at the time. I think we could see more amazing applications of Nanite and One for All being used at the same time to overwhelm him, maybe even going the route of a giant monster fight with Deku lose control to the point he goes full Evo again. In the end, Overhaul is still going to be defeated and locked away in Tartarus, however, with Toga and Twice not there though, the Yakuza boss is not betrayed by the League, and thus he is transported to Tartarus without issue, also leading to the continued survival of Snatch in this timeline. Next, the remedial course does not take place, and there is very little change to the school festival arc. I suppose Deku's technopathy could make finding and stopping Gentle and Labrava easier for him, though the most major change is when Deku makes contact with the former wielders this time, it is in order for them to impart a hard to understand warning on him, as he can't quite make out what they're saying. When he awakens, his cold has become worse than ever, and he begins seeking medical attention for it. Endeavor's rise to number one, and his and Hawk's team up against the Hood Nomu is completely unchanged in any significant way. Now, while the Metal Liberation Army arc and the anime takes place after the joint training arc, which is what we should cover next in the manga, the events take place in the opposite order, so we'll go ahead and say those events don't change significantly either, since there just really isn't much to change. Since the classes are even, there will be no sharing of Shinzo between two teams, and because he and Kendo are in Class 1A and Class 1B respectively already, the matchups are simpler in general. Nanites and One for All also don't really lend much change here, and really no matter what combination of teams and opponents, I don't think many but Shinzo could see the quirks go out of control or have Deku contact the past builders again, so we'll leave at least his team matchup the same. Though, trust me, I do recognize the missed opportunity in not just making randomized matchups, I just don't think they're really worth going through at this point. So, as Black Whip manifests itself, Deku is again given his warning, but this time much more clearly. Pass on one for all as soon as possible. Thus, leading to one major change during the Endeavor Agency arc. One for all is passed on to Mirio Togata. And this would bring us to the latest events adapted by the anime, and therefore the extent of where most anime only is and most of my viewers know the story of My Hero Academia. Though, as I'm sure you can see, this video is far from over, and I'm also sure a lot of you are curious as to why Deku is suddenly so sick and what it has to do with his needing to pass down one for all, or just why I'm not being very in depth with the story. However, to do that, we'll need to get into spoiler territory, and because of that spoiler territory, there is a timestamp on screen if you want to avoid them. This part of the video is effectively going to be a mini video essay that will be based all around why I think this format of giving Deku some different power from another series leads to fundamentally flawed what-if scenarios. 
Once we're done with that, for those who are willing to stick through spoilers for the manga and my ramblings, we'll be treated to me at least giving a rundown of how this timeline will continue until it's caught up with the current final arc of the series, and therefore it's ending. So, thanks for watching so far, if the rest of the video disinterests you, or just the way it's going currently isn't to your liking, I totally understand if you click off at this point. It would mean a lot to me if you didn't, just so you could understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, but I would understand. And for those still along for the ride, welcome to why My Hero Academia What Ifs can go beyond. So the very short and uncomplicated reasoning for why these types of scenarios where you either take out or add to one for all is Deku's main power or ability, whichever term better applies, case by case I guess, with powers or abilities from another series, something we're going to from here on out refer to as Deku X stories, is because Horikoshi himself has made the ideas inconsistently work with his own narrative. During chapter 304 or volume 31 depending on how you're reading, we learn from the fourth wielder of one for all, Hikage Shinomori, that if a one for all user has a quirk before they are given one for all, then their lifespans are drastically reduced, as he himself died at the age of only 40, meaning his lifespan was effectively cut in half. And this is when he had a version of one for all that is less than half as powerful as Deku's current version is. So realistically, or at least consistent with the narrative, if Deku were to have a quirk and then be given one for all, or had All Might decided to give one for all to Mirio after meeting him as Sir Night Eye wanted originally, then both would have likely died since theoretically, a one for all of the current magnitude would be cutting off effectively 9 90% of a person's lifespan. That means on a highball that a one for all user would have about 8 years to live. And that's being charitable since one could easily argue that if the user is already over 8 years old, their body may simply give out due to not having the capacity to even hold all of one for all. Regardless of how well they prepare, there just is a limited amount of space and energy and reproduction that your individual cells can take in a body. Which would in turn leave the world defenseless to all for one before we formally even meet him by the time of chapter 90. and. That would just be the end of the story. While I highly, highly doubt Horikoshi has ever paid attention to YouTube videos on subjects he's not interested in, or likely at all considering what his work schedule is probably like, there is admittedly a very arrogant part of me who thinks Horikoshi may have made such a decision for the good of his series and for his longevity as a story after realizing some of the most creative or at least the most prevalent ideas his fans can come up with when thinking of alternate universes for his series are pretty much epitomized by what if Deku became a villain or what if Deku had the powers of insert cliche anime badass here. And again, in my opinion, that stuff is just so creatively bankrupt. I don't think there's a lot of meat on either of those bones. Not to mention the idea of Quirks always having some reasonable drawback or limit more so than handing that hero or villain or whoever holds the power some a guffin like weakness, i.e. your kryptonites or the color yellow for like Green Lantern, is more consistent with the world building the series has always set and thrived on. So this is also a decision by the author that I have always supported just on that basis. Really wouldn't make sense that a lot of the characters that we've seen in the series who go through the trouble of trying to have multiple quirks held in one body and have to sacrifice some form of humanity or like some form of normality it really seems like that should be more consistent around the series. And even beyond all of that, with One For All already lending itself to be such a versatile ability by carrying over past users' abilities, it also makes these scenarios a bit null and void because you could essentially just ask what if people with the desired powers were past One For All holders. But there are still some fairly large flaws with that format as well because number one, you're already gonna lock yourself down into some pretty boring story beat. And number two, a majority of the abilities chosen in these stories would still be ones which work in ways that make one for all itself obsolete or redundant. Now, I do recognize that people who enjoy this kind of content have some excuses or rebuttals to my position, like, oh, well, in some Deku X stories, he doesn't even get one for all, or they bring in aspects of the series they borrow power from to freshen the story up by having new characters, locations, or phenomena be introduced to My Hero Academia, or even the dreaded, it's a what if, none of this is canon, I can do whatever I want. But none of these really present a solution to the issues I'm pointing out here, as the stories Deku doesn't get one for all in but some other quirks usually are ones where that power is something stronger scaling wise than one for all and which likely allows the character to do the exact same thing. And when you just haphazardly throw in aspects of another series world, you pretty instantly start to break the world building of one or most likely both of those series. Like I've seen a bunch of what if Deku had the Omnitrix or what if Deku was Ben 10 or whatever you want to call it. And I think that's actually a really strong concept just because I very obviously love all the stuff that came from Man of Action. But at the exact same time, I've also seen a lot of those stories just kind of throw the space of Ben 10 out into the world and my 
here academia's earth is just the earth that is in that world and it's really weird because that is a really expansive universe that has some pretty big implications if the my here academia earth has just always been there and let's be honest saying it's a what if i can do what i want is a cop out and always has been I don't think an alternate universe needs to mean child's toy box. Now granted, there is something pure and innocent and beautiful about a little kid being able to dump their toys out on the floor and just form a story out of whatever they want, however they want, with no constraints. But I think past a certain age, if your goal is actually to tell a story that people can get enjoyment out of, your writing strategy probably shouldn't match that of someone who doesn't know how to use the toilet yet. Hence why I claim Deku X What If stories are fundamentally flawed. Remember, a what if as just a concept is posed as a question specifically because the answer shouldn't be immediately obvious. This is also why some what if ideas are inherently stronger concepts than others. Great example, it doesn't take much speculation to realize Goku would probably just explode if he got Ultra Instinct early. While the concept of Goku winning against Jackie Chun so early on in Dragon Ball may not have as much inherent intrigue as Goku getting UI early, it is still a stronger concept because if you have a strong enough grasp of the Dragon Ball story, you realize so much is instantly subject to change and is open for more speculation. But if Deku and anyone else around him who may get a different quirk just have slightly different ways to do the same things we see them do in canon, or if they do the same things but stronger and cooler, or if they do the same things but now there's a guy from a different story there, those are just objectively weaker ideas. They are flawed from their foundation up, hence fundamentally flawed. This concept of Deku attaining the powers of Generator Rex, as fun as it may be and as much as a lot of you may have enjoyed it, which I truly appreciate, was flawed. Now if you personally enjoy these kinds of what ifs, or you're a fan of someone who does them, or you want to do them yourselves, I don't think there is anything wrong with that at all. There is a lot of content posted on YouTube and other platforms that is objectively kind of worse than Deku X stories to me. The absolute laziest Deku X what if -er is still a better person character wise and a better content creator than anyone who decides to go on fanfic.net or wherever, steal someone's fanfic, put it in a text to speech bot and then pass it off as if they'd done any work whatsoever. I'm not condemning the people who make this stuff in any way that's supposed to be Hellfire and Brimstone. I'm simply saying that as for me in this channel, Generator Deku will be my only soiree into Deku X stories in any kind of full series capacity, as I am much more interested in kind of crossover or character adaptation scenarios or discussions along with scenarios that just change major aspects of the story in meaningful ways. Fun ideas I've always had are what if a lot of the old 90s or 2000 to 2013-ish era superhero cartoon characters I grew up with had counterparts in the My Hero Academia universe, and more so had their worlds fused. So using characters like Kim Possible, American Dragon Jake Long, El Tigre, the TMNT, Danny Phantom, and tons of other characters, and finding ways for them to exist in Horikoshi's setting rather than slapping their powers on Deku haphazardly and somewhat having him mirror their personality. Or imagine a Ben Tennyson in MHA who brings with him the implication that Vilgax and all the other aliens in the galaxy and their squabbles exist up there in space, giving the heroes evil to fight off from both Earth or space. Could do the same with another Man of Action series, Secret Saturdays, only replacing the aliens with cryptids and having a lot of fun with Zack Saturday in a school setting most likely. Or, most obviously, Rex Salazar and MHA who brings with him a nanite wave, which could possibly even be used to explain the origins of quirks in this timeline thereby eliminating tough decisions like the one I had to make when I was deciding whether or not Stain should become an Evo. To me, I really don't think those kinds of ideas or very obviously intriguing questions like what if All Might found Shigaraki first or what if Endeavor saved Dobby or as evidenced by it still being one of the most popular things I've ever done, what if Stain trained Deku? I just don't think those kinds of ideas and scenarios can be considered on the same level of interest or holding the same level of inherent quality and creativity as the average Deku X story. I also find it really funny that a majority of Naruto what ifs I see are also basically just this phenomenon and also are usually a little bit worse because remember Naruto is a completed story so it should be a lot easier to make more creative decisions than the vast majority of what I see which just boiled down to someone who has absolutely no idea what is actually cool trying to write a badass and edgy Naruto who has like nuclear radiation or the Renegon or something else which just breaks the story and his character. And also, really often completely unearned, making the power itself so unsatisfying. And I should also mention, and again I hope this does not come off as ageist or in any way demeaning or derogatory, 
that this phenomenon combined with the majority of people who enjoy this kind of content and who want to try it themselves being so much younger belies number one a staggering amount of low self-esteem in the authors who write these stories and then turn Deku or Naruto or whatever other main character into very blank self-inserts and number two it always 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 shows the most baffling misunderstandings of a series main character or an incredible lack of maturity in one's ability to interact with media that reflects aspects of oneself that they dislike. The fact of the matter is, a lot more of us than would like to admit it are whiny and sensitive crybabies with a heart of gold like Deku, or are knuckle-headed braggarts who struggle to back up what they say but still give it their all anyway just like Naruto. And in my opinion, accepting that fact would probably lead to a lot of confidence and progress for the people who write these stories as an escape from feelings of powerlessness. So, if I have actually managed to keep any of you here and not made anybody too mad, I will go ahead and try and run through the end of this timeline and we'll make it as vague as possible since a lot of this stuff is just about to be adapted by the anime and I don't want to spoil you guys for that. And some of it is the content of the last arc, so again, it'll be as vague as humanly possible. I think all you'll really be learning is just the name of what a lot of people call some of these arcs. So, the thing that gets animated next in Season 6, the Paranormal Liberation War arc, sees little change other than the fact that Mirio as the new one for all holder is involved. He's now the 10th holder, and due to this and his natural affinity for the power as predicted by Night Eye, Mirio is capable of using 100% of his power and is stronger than Deku ever could be with the ability. So, Deku, Bakugo, and Lemillion try to take out Shigi, but are unsuccessful. Bakugo still comes up with his hero name finally, meaning our dynamic duo in this timeline are known as Generator and Spoiler. <laughs> the Prison Break arc effectively doesn't happen, or it effectively can't happen in any way that we would recognize, since no one for all means no real pressure on Deku, and Mirio is able to help a lot more effectively than Deku was able to during this time in canon due to being stronger and in a better place mentally. The Star and Stripe and UA Trader arcs see no significant changes either, and the only change in the current Final War arc would be that the battle plans are centered around Mirio instead of Deku. And considering in the latest chapters that has actually been somewhat of a plot point in and of itself, that's actually not too hard of a change for us to manage in the story. So it would probably be good to just go ahead and let it end here, and probably just say that the story of My Hero Academia possibly just ends a little sooner because Mirio just kind of saves the day that quick. So with no more canon to cover, this Post Ultra Fam and any new viewers who might have watched this and stayed to this long, thank you so much, is where the story ends for good. All right, everyone, that does it. And there's nothing to shout out here that wasn't in the original videos or that isn't listed in the doobly doo below. So we go right into our shout outs for the channel members and the patrons. Gino Gaster Sands, Pokemon Trainer Cam, K Kitsune, Dark Shadow, John Sullivan, Genesium, Knuckles OX, Robert Ostergar, Tailed God, Trent Rouse, Samuel Vivero, Sage Serendipity, PJ9D the Third, Nomalos Phantom, Jimmy Alexandre, Jamal Hayden, Jacoby Shaner, Infernate Beast 326, Inurbreed, Drax, Dominic Wade, Dominique, Squad 100, Shannon Roberts, Omar Cousin, Jay Uray, Don Sauce, Normandy 1998, Dreadpool, Narku, Aaron Winters, Knuckles OX again, Pizza 15X, Zach Haji, DJ the Lazy Gamer, and Crimson Manifesto. Thank you all so much for your direct support of the channel, it means the world. As always, remember to take care of yourselves and the world around you, and be sure to go beyond Plus Ultra, and I'll see you guys next time.